RCB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. All right, it's Monday morning. You're very welcome along to OTBAM. It's Jerry Gilroy and Owen Sheehan with you. Owen, welcome back. Welcome home, buddy. You're alive. I am indeed. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Your voice croaked a little bit there, Owen. Oh, my voice always croaks on a Monday. That is just uh, par for the course, isn't it? Okay, yeah. It sounds like you've um, had a good weekend. Oh, I mean, like a, an absolutely great weekend, a great week. And, uh, I mean, I've been slammed, I think, on social media after my appearance on Friday morning, but... We, uh, we we approach it with a water off a duck's back approach and, and we're here fresh as a daisy this morning. And then Ryanair made a video about you. <laughs> the weirdest thing I've ever Very seen. It is the weirdest thing I've ever seen as well. And uh, I, I think we need to put this into the, to the rear view mirror for a number of reasons. Well, it, it freaked me out, that video. Well, you say that, Owen, but you know us well enough at this point to know that for the next five years, this is literally all you're going to hear about. <laughs> I like I was I was I was worried you were actually just gonna throw to the video there. Like I'm I'm happy to hear about everything, but, but the video was strange. Um, the, well, you know, it, it was it was all fair game and uh, getting getting uh, <laughs> destroyed by uh, an airline on social media. Uh, the the admin who I believe is an off the ball fan um, is 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 not exactly how I expected things to go. Well, it, I mean, there was obviously a bit of love. He he knew all about you, and and yet couldn't do enough to just get the plane stopped for you. Well, I mean, it's uh, it, it, that's not his fault. It's not uh, not the airline's fault. It is entirely my fault. We've been through this, and uh, the, the finger is firmly pointed at me. I've come to terms with the responsibility that I must take. I must go back to the drawing board and uh, rediscover myself as a human being. Yeah. Um, nobody believed your story on Friday, though. Everybody said there were, I think the exact phrase was, there are holes in that story. <laughs> I, I don't understand this, this, this scepticism. Like, do you just not believe that I am a full-blown idiot? I, I don't understand why you can't just take that at face value. I am an idiot. Listen to me when I tell you that. Did they talk to you about um, going to the Paris Saint-Germain game even? Did that, did that come up? No, that's been relegated to, right, to the B-side. Right, and a bit part. Okay. That's yeah. been, yeah. I mean... Like what was the, it like? It was great. I, it was great. I mean, it, I, like, I was blissfully unaware uh, until a couple of days afterwards, uh, like, about the the level that the Messi narrative would get to because I thought he was sensational. Um, I even looked at the keep player ratings afterwards. I think he got a nine, maybe maybe an eight, but he was one of their highest rated players, if not their, their highest rated player. It was a bizarre moment when he got taken off, but nobody in the stadium really cared that much by the sounds of things. I was right in the middle of the ultras, so the tone doesn't really change whatsoever. It's just a constant hum of hate towards the Leon fans and general bigging up of your own identity as a Paris Saint-Germain fan. But if anybody has the opportunity to go to a game, it is one of the greatest atmospheres in European football. If you buy the cheapest ticket, which is in with the, the Ultras, um, it's not exactly an unintimidating place to be. I'm pretty sure they didn't want me there. And I'm pretty sure somebody told me in French to get the hell out of there. But I couldn't understand him, so I stayed put and, uh, and all was good. Did you wear a carry jersey? No, I did not. No, I did not. That would have got. If you. I did, I would have been on TV. You would have seen. You would have seen it, and I, and I would have got hate for that on Twitter before the Ryanair thing. <laughs> well, I mean, at least it would have been something else to well, balance it out over the course of the week. Like people get really, really annoyed with with Kerry jerseys. It seems like there was there was two at the Manchester United game on Saturday. Another couple, I think, at the Ryder Cup. The Man United ones you kind of get away with because they're that old third jersey, same colour, suggests that you're anti-Glazers, Newton Heath, that, all that kind of... Yeah. There's a, there's a little bit of tapping into that when, I mean, look, obviously all you're trying to do is get on TV because you're wearing a carry jersey. Mm. Ultimately, that's that's your excuse. It, it um, I don't know. It, it's become a thing. It has. It's it's uh, like it's a meme at this point. Uh, like, but just people get very exercised about it. But no, I I decided not to to, to wear the Kerry jersey at, at that particular moment. Also, I think I would have. Stu- I already stood out like a, a sore thumb. I don't think I needed to to stick out any further. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Here's what's coming up between now and the end of the show this morning. We're going to get into the performance rankings immediately. Mark Lawrence, I'm going to join us after five past eight. Pretty interesting weekend of football. If you're a Man United fan, we'd love to hear from you. If you're an Arsenal fan, we'd love to hear from you. If you're a Spurs fan, if you're a Chelsea fan, if you're a Villa fan, if you're any of those teams and you've got views that you would like us to put to Mark Lawrence and or indeed talk about between now and the end of the show, we will. Uh, you can get us on YouTube. Of course, you can tweet us at Off the Ball AM. We'll run you through the sports pages briefly because there's too much, literally too much sport happened over the weekend for us to get into everything properly today. The Ryder Cup, going to talk with Nathan at 8.40. We've got Alan Quinlan talking rugby. Rugby saved at the weekend. The All Blacks beat the Springboks at nine o'clock. Um, we'll update you on our plans for our duathlon. 
with Boop at 20 past nine. And then we're going to hear from Fiona Hayes about the shit show that was the Irish rugby team uh, over the course of the weekend when they got beaten by Scotland to crash out of the World Cup, not even going to the repechage. Didn't even make the repechage. Time for the performance rankings. You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is was just lack that intensity. You're, uh, you're, you're in the red, are you? I, yeah, I should be. Thankfully, sport saved me over the course of the weekend. There was enough to, to paper over the cracks, and this is uh, firmly a story of the past. So what we've got in the red uh, and the amber and the green today. So Team Europe and Irish rugby in the red. So we'll get into that in just a moment. Team Europe, obviously, in the context of the Ryder Cup. Kerry GEA in the amber and then Usyk and the Premier League in the green. So if we start with, with Team Europe uh, a little bit here, this is a Ryder Cup which probably have a lot of people thinking uh, the Ryder Cup is, is over, it's dead. It's, it's only going to go one way for the, for the next 20 years or so. And I think we need to, to remember that this has been said in, in the past, like Alan Shipnook, who in fairness to him, uh, has kind of owned this article a little, a little bit over the last four years, uh, wrote a piece in, in 2017 saying, the young, talented, hungry golfers in the United States benefiting from the cohesive leadership of the task force era are going to roll to victory in 2018 in Paris. We all know what happened in 2018 in Paris. Europe rolled to victory on that particular occasion. He says, uh, I suppose when all of the above comes true, I'll be celebrated as some sort of Nostradamus and Knickers. But believe me, I take no pleasure in writing this column. The Ryder Cup, as we know it, was great fun. I'm going to miss it. And he obviously got widely slammed after the results in Paris. Rory McIlroy, Sergio Garcia laughing at him, basically, in the press conference. Rory McIlroy goes, where's Alan Shipnuck? And I guess we all thought Shipnuck was wrong. But the narrative has totally changed to this article, I guess, over the past 24 hours in particular, the, the magnitude of the victory, I can see why people will be sitting this morning thinking, well, this is a, a write-off for the next few years because the age profile of this team is just incredible. So, yeah, yeah. He, he, he was right. He, but like, so, so, he, so he got it wrong early. He was just a little bit early, a little bit of a premature inscription. Mm. But, uh, but he's 100% correct. The, like, how, how is this European team ever going to get... Now, look... We'll, we'll need to get into the captaincy and the legacy of Harrington. We'll talk with um, with Nathan about that a little bit later on. Like, could if Paul McGinley had been captain, would the score have been nineteen nine? I'm not sure. It might have been, but here's the thing: it might be nineteen nine for all of these ones, with the exception of the ones in Europe, where obviously the they'll be a little bit closer. It might be uh, sixteen twelve. It might be like it might be eighteen ten. Is it like, but uh, well, just just to be like devil's advocate on that point, like had Medina not happened, and the, the last eight Ryder Cups would have been won by the home team. Home advantage is a massive thing, and if you think that the, this Italian course in two years' time is going to be something that suits the American bombers, for example, like there's absolutely no chance of that happening. There, there, there was a real sense that in Paris the course didn't suit them. That's because it was the European home course. Like, I do think we get carried away in the moment with these things. Of course, this was a phenomenal performance from a phenomenal team with a brilliant age profile that are going to be around for a long time. But things change quickly. Like, three years ago, at the last Ryder Cup, we were celebrating Francesco Molinari winning all five of his available points that weekend. He wasn't even close to, to making this team. Now, granted, three years is a, is a big old window uh, compared to the usual Ryder Cup, but, but things do change. The home advantage is a thing. And yes, this US team, it could possibly be as good as the, the 1981 team where you have Nicholas and Watson and Lee Trevino and, and, and an amazing collection of superstars that probably is still up there as, as the greatest Ryder Cup team of all time. And the thing is, this, this one is going nowhere and they're hungry and they've got a better setup than they've yeah. had at any point in the last yeah, 20 they years. Finally, they finally aren't completely overshadowed by Tiger and Phil. Right, there's yeah. and there's nobody there's nobody of that ilk coming through who's going to overshadow all of the rest. And Colin Marikawa doesn't really care about Brooks Kepka, it seems. Like whatever that whatever the character of Brooks is, is not is has become kind of isolated over the last week in that he was less important to them. He's nowhere near a spiritual leader of that group. Like uh Spieth, whose career was off track for eighteen months, comes back and, and plays and like I 
you know, and he's kind of in the middle of the pack as opposed to like the... Spieth was essentially at the level of Sergio from a European perspective where it was like, oh, this is a kid who's going to be really important for American golf. For the next, and then he goes disappears and the bunch of new kids come up who like have better track records in college and who have done these amazing record-breaking things that nobody's ever done since Tiger Woods. And they're all bombing the ball past. Yeah. Like... Uh, and so th- th- this American team, by w- virtue of their rankings, considered one of the greatest teams of all time, that's not going to change. There's going to be more Americans coming through the American collegiate system, which obviously has industrialized the process of getting golfers to the point of being super competitive on the PGA Tour. And there's no European dream factory like that. There no. is no equivalent. No, but the, the, like the the conferable has always been there. Like the, the collegiate system has always been better. There's always been a, a like a better, like I, I accept the... Things get better, things improve. Like but the industrialization of the process might not have been as as high quality and, and maybe people turn pro a little bit earlier. Now they're maybe they're staying a few years later and arriving more fully formed in the professional ranks. Whatever has happened, I don't know what has happened. Maybe the, it's, it's a boom post-Tiger that all those kids who started to take up golf in the late 90s are coming through now and they've seen what Tiger did and they're, it's like all sports everything gets better constantly because better technology uh, better nutrition better psychology and whatever else right whatever else it is that influences the sport to make it better <clears throat> uh, and I don't, I don't know how the disparate European tour which is getting com- constantly dwarfed and pushed down by the Americans I think Alan Shipnuck's prediction is going to come true that they're going to dominate the next decade yeah like uh... I, I, it's it's hard to to make a case against that, but just just to be devil's advocate again for ju- just a moment, like there are other spots around Europe where things look to be on the upward trajectory. Like when you look at someone like Victor Hovland in his first Ryder Cup, uh, like I, I thought he was brilliant yesterday um, against Mark Howe, and that that's going to be a, a battle that we that we probably see in the future. Like there there are countries producing golfers that we haven't seen too often producing golfers, and there there is a growth in the game uh, in Sweden in particular, and I, I'm just guessing now it's across Scandinavia as a result of that. Like there are going to be coincidental things that happen like that that produce generational talents of course it's going to be more accidental than the industrialization that has happened in the united states yeah and look you know obviously john Rahm comes through the american collegiate system victor hovland yeah. comes through the uh, american collegiate system the european there, tour doesn't actually matter then in that in that case like, well uh, the other side of that is that like uh, they it's it's harder for those golfers over a period of time they've got to rise to be the best here and then they've got to compete at that age to be the best in America as well. Maybe maybe America comes over here and scouts and it's like uh, the best young Irish footballers going to English academies in the 70s and 80s and that's okay. I don't know. I just It just feels like uh, we're going to be reliant on America to give us the John Rams and the Victor Hovland's college experience because we don't have the equivalent here. Um, like the thing is, it's it's not that. It is also the, the, the current crop. Like Shipnick was making the point that if you look at their core stars, so that's Brooks, Spieth, DJ, Marikawa, Bryson, JT, Xander, Cantley, and Tony Finau, the average age of that group is 29. So th- you can copy and paste that into, into the next Ryder Cup and they would probably win the next Ryder Cup or be favoured to do so. But then they come up against a, an absolute uh, pain of an Italian course and it, it, the, the script flips entirely. Like what, what, what is a really, uh, like there, there are a number of different threads coming from this and as you say, we'll get into it more with, with Nathan a little bit uh, uh, later on, but... Like the role of the captain and all of this is is an interesting one because, like Patrick Harrington's legacy was something that was put into, into into focus because before the Ryder Cup he said that his legacy will be dependent on what happens over the course of the Ryder Cup and then, like that's a really interesting debate that's kind of popped up over the last uh, 12, 24 hours about does this tarnish Patrick Harrington's legacy and it's it's a really interesting conversation because I definitely think it would have enhanced his legacy had they won at the weekend. Or had there been some sort of heroic comeback where it was a lot closer, maybe it would have been enhanced it a little bit as well. Does it tarnish it then, uh, getting an absolute hockeying from this USA team? Like it's Maybe it does if you're going to play by those rules, but at the same time, is the legacy of Paul Jack Harrington now not always just going to be three-time major winner, not three, three-time major winner plus Ryder Cup captain who lost by 10 points? Well, that that's just gets always, airbrushed out a little bit. It doesn't. You can't. You can't airbrush it. Now, that's the whole point about sport: is you play the competition and you win or lose. There's like, a, mm-hmm. there is no. It's binary in in that instance. I mean, maybe there would have been a moral victory if 
they'd won an extra five points yesterday, that would have been ten point swings, so that would have been uh, enough to get them through. If they'd won four more points and they'd lost by two, and it's like, oh, they were pretty close, or they only needed an extra half to mm. retain the trophy. Like, at that point, you're like, oh, wow, what an amazing comeback. Something he did to interrupt the process must have happened, but I don't know enough about the the way that the foursomes pairings happen, the four ball pairings happen, and maybe his his hands were tied by the the selection process, and then that is absolutely something that needs to get fixed for the next time round. But can you point to anything that he did that made the situation better? Um, not necessarily, but if you look at yesterday in isolation, like you had uh, David Duval on on Golf Channel, which was obviously carried in, on, on Sky beforehand saying that there will be serious questions over Paul Duke Harrington's captaincy because he's sending Rory McIlroy out first. He dropped him the previous day, now he's sending him out first. Mixed messages. And then McGinley kind of like refuted that by saying actually what he's doing is trying to send some symbolism to the rest of the team. That if you send Ma- McIlroy out first and he wins and the rest of the team see that, then that's going to give a massive boost to the team. And he did win. And, it, and like the McIlroy thing in isolation, which was the, the most contentious point around Paul Duke Harrington yesterday, came off. So... well. Yeah, and, and look, I, I think in a situation like this where a team gets absolutely annihilated, there is enough blame to go around for everybody. Let's hear from Roy McIlroy speaking. This is to the Americans in the immediate aftermath of, uh, of his defeat yesterday. Thierry, have a look. I've gotten to do this six times. They've always been my greatest, greatest experiences in my career. I have not, never really cried or got emotional over what I've done as an individual. I couldn't give a shit, but... This team um, and and what and what what it feels like to be a part of to, to see Sergio break records to see John Ram come into his own this week um, you know to, to see one of my best friends Shane Laurie but you know make his Ryder Cup debut all that is just it's phenomenal and I'm so so happy to be a part of it I'm you know as I said I'm disappointed that I didn't contribute more this week um, but you know and. Two years time will go again and um, and try to, you know, obviously it's not over yet, but, you know, we'll we'll give it our, give it another go again. Sorry, sorry for swearing back then as well. Okay, Rory, (laughs) thanks for taking the time. I know you're emotional. Dan, back. I know you're emotional. Let's let's not ask you any more questions at this <laughs> this particular moment where you might give me one of the best answers I've ever got. Yeah. We've got to get right back because something else is happening. It's like just tease that out a little bit longer there. Let's see what else he has to say. Yeah, like it does seem like this is um, a, a, an important moment in the the, the the national and international love for M- Rory McIlroy. Maybe I'm overstating it. No, I, I think am, I think but like it, I think I think that might be right because he had a, a terrible week. Yeah, and then wins in the last day, and like oh, it was it Jason Sobo was tweeting. Nobody's ever watched Rory McIlroy not make anything happen until the Sunday when it doesn't really matter. Hasn't been paying attention. Which I was like, oh, that is pretty. That is damn. Yeah, and it's true. Except then, you know, stuff like that. It's like, actually, that that does matter. I, I like it, it, it's also kind of like a, a terrible thing to say, but late on in his, his round, when it, it was evident that he was going to win, uh, like he was obviously quite happy in how he was playing, and I, I kind of thought to myself, well, he's satisfied with his day's work in kind of like a negative way to think about Rory McIlroy, and then you hear that interview afterwards, and you're and you're like, geez, I was completely wrong about that because it was absolutely about the team even what he said about Shane Lowry it, like it's evident I mean they, they do have a very good relationship but even just hearing him say that my, my good friend Shane Lowry making his Ryder Cup debut like pointing him out when he's in that emotional state was kind of a nice thing to hear and I mean he doesn't have to prove anything to anyone Rory McIlroy you go through any of his interviews he is a very interesting guy and a very thoughtful guy and somebody who, who loves the Ryder Cup loves the game and is generally quite a likable person if, if you read enough of his interviews. But at the same time, I felt myself more on his side after listening to that interview. And I don't know, maybe maybe we should have been listening closer to, to, to McElroy for a little bit longer, uh, because I think even if you think, oh, I like Roy McElroy, I think we all have these... Uh, a little thing deep down where you're, you're still just 100%, not 100% sure about him, but I think I think yesterday was maybe a, a good moment for him reputation-wise. Yeah, so I, I, do, do Irish people think, are, are they, are they back, back, in, back in on Rory McIlroy? Well, the, I think, I think the, the, the conclusion to, uh, to the Olympics was a, was a pretty positive moment for, for, for Ireland's relationship with, with McIlroy, the conclusion to the Olympics. Uh, quick Europe, European rankings in the, the Times of London... John Ram eight, Tommy Fleetwood five, Tyrrell Hatton six, Bern Wiesberger five, Roy McIlroy five, Victor Hovland six, 
Paul Casey, four. Matt Fitzpatrick, four. Lee Westwood, four. Garcia, eight. Ian Poulter, four. And Shane Lowry, five. One less than Tyrrell Hatton. Mad how that happens. Isn't it? Yeah. And then um, it's all eights. Well, it's not really. It's uh, Scheffler, Shoffley, Cantlay, Bryson, Marikawa, eight. Dustin Johnson, nine. Brooks Kepka five. That'll win him another couple of majors. <laughs> somebody somebody uh, snitch tag him there on Twitter and tell him that the Times of London only gave him a five and uh, give him the fuel for the fire that he needs. So that's that's the European Ryder Cup team in the red. Harrington's legacy, we'll talk about that a bit more with Nathan, but if uh, we're definitely interested to hear what people think about that. Does he get a free pass? Is it a free pass for being in charge for the worst paddling that we've had? In the competition, no, it's not. It's not a free pass, but it's a, I think it's a separate conversation to legacy. Because so, I think legacy then, is then, then the Ryder Cup doesn't matter. Is what you're saying? You're literally saying the Ryder Cup doesn't matter, well, and that's fair enough. That is a viewpoint. Well, yeah. Well, I think legacy is a complicated thing, and I I, I don't think that legacy encapsulates everything. Like, like th- think of think of sports people who've done terrible things, and like this is totally separate from from golf. Like we often airbrush out the terrible things that people have done. Now, Project Harrington has done nothing terrible here, but we often completely change our view on a sports person and completely focus on the positive things that that person has done. Now, in the, in the context of just the competitive aspects of Project Harrington, I reckon this will the, the legacy of, of this man will be focused on the majors and the, the asterisk will, will fade into obscurity as time goes by because people are biased when they talk about legacy. People want to, to reflect on the positivity when it comes to legacy, I think. Uh, I'm w- not saying that's right or wrong. One, one quick note. Um, I had somebody who was a mate of mine was at the um, was at the event and was interested in the commentary. Essentially, uh, not one fan was thrown out of this drunken hellhole, says the Times, uh, the <laughs> London Times this morning. Uh, Wisconsin builds itself as America's dairy land, <laughs> so it was only to be expected the galleries of the 43rd Ryder Cup would feature some kind of bovine behaviour. Throw in Milwaukee, the nearest city of any size, the Whistling Straits, and a boorish backdrop became even more predictable. Uh, so one of my mates was like, there were definitely some drunken idiots shouting out some ridiculous stuff, but the majority were Midwestern Americans who were lovely. Um, and uh, essentially says... I was just off the first tee when JT and Berger sucked the beers. Mikhailov lights, so it doesn't count as beer. All a good fun. Casey and Stenson were winding up the crowd as much as they were and actually getting a bigger rise. Uh, there seems to be a whole lot going on about the boorish American fans and uh, it doesn't sound like they were boorish at all, really. It was brilliant and, um, yeah, so... I mean, really, we could all sit here and tut, tut, tut. Oh, isn't it terrible? They're making this amazing entertainment for us on the TV by being themselves. Yeah, like we all need to get over ourselves. It's a golf crowd, like it's totally fine. It's actually totally fine. I I kind of agree with that to be honest. And like I've, I've obviously heard plenty of commentary saying that it's been despicable and uh, a shame in the game and all that over, over the last couple of days. But I'm not I'm not sure I'd go that far. Like no, I mean, yeah, no. yes, there can be a guy who is an idiot, and yeah, uh, yes, every there, village every village and uh, every golf crowd and every American golf crowd will have that. That is that is just the reality of the situation. Yeah, but it actually, you know, generally the crowd being trending that direction is better for sport. Um, the next thing in the red this morning, and it's uh, like one of the probably the biggest story in Irish sport maybe over the course of the weekend, and it is uh, the women's rugby team uh, getting beaten, not even getting a repechage to qualify for the World Cup. Uh, an absolute... Uh, is disaster too strong a word for this? Well, for, for the women's game in uh, Ireland, it is setting them back about a decade, right? It, it's like, it's like back to the 60s, essentially. <laughs> like, do you know? And But it's kind of the chickens coming home to roost for the IRFU. Anybody who's been, uh, been following what the IRFU have been doing with Irish women's rugby is like not that surprised, essentially, by what's happened here. It was like, oh, we're going to build a sevens team. And then it's like, yeah, look, it'll, it'll be grand. But... The thing is that the stink that's on the IRFU's treatment of the game for the women, you can't wash it away now. There's no, there's no, the the stuff in Energy at Park, like that is the reality. That is the reality of where the women's game is in Ireland. It wasn't like an oversight. It wasn't a scheduling issue. It's like it's grand. It'll do, because uh, I don't know. I mean, the IRFU. They've got an opportunity now. It'd be interesting to see if there's um, any women candidates who are like viable candidates for the new chief executive officer role. And where's David Hughes for in all this? Who who holds him to account? Oh, we're gonna we're gonna reach a World Cup semi final, but actually it was all it was all a couple of other lads' fault. Nothing to do with me. 
although you're there in the tracksuit. Like, I don't know. I mean, mm. it doesn't seem like they've got the playing side correct when it comes to the women. And that would suggest that they haven't put the money and the time and the investment in. And, and they can, you know, they can blame the players. Sure, the players absolutely have to hold responsibility. They're, they were good enough to win that game. And they didn't. And they didn't see it out. And uh, it sounds like their strategy was bad. But you underinvest. You bad inputs equals bad outputs. Like the the Nusa Four angle is, is interesting because he's obviously been asked about this quite a bit. So if you look at his comments from February of this year, I guess one of the things that is always asked when this story comes up is about professionalism and the team needs to go professional and that is the first step where Lucifer sees that as not the first step whatsoever he says professionalism may become a reality at some stage in the future and it's an admirable aspiration for the game he says to produce a sustainable women's game of high quality the immediate focus needs to be on increasing the size of the player pool by creating pathways for young girls and women that gives them easy access to the game and what I'd like to know is have those pathways being created has there been a start on that project I, I'm sure there's been something done I mean to go on the record and actually say that for somebody who doesn't go on the record too often I'm sure he's probably thought about it before saying it so like I want to know what those those pathways are what is the investment that's going into the game because we know that Irish rugby at the moment and a lot of sporting organisations are not in a financially good place making investment is a is a big commitment but at the same time increasing the size of the player pool by creating pathways for young girls is something that he has committed to on the record and maybe we haven't start, started to see just yet like he says once players are given access and meaningful competition formats connected to a player pathway talent will be identified and developed he says that it's a common challenge across the women's game around the world that must be solved before professionalism can be sustainable but at the same time, it kind of seems that other countries are powering forward with professionalism and Ireland are kind of standing still and clearly as a result going backwards in, in the reckoning of the world. The pandemic affected everybody. Everybody's men's team, men's national team uh, didn't have fans involved. So your, so your main supply line of, of cash was, was ruled out. And yet the Ireland women's team in the context of the world are going backwards. And you have those humiliating scenes for them a couple of weeks ago with the, the changing conditions. Um, like the 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 the, this, the game is in its early stages when it comes to that uh, venture towards um, professionalism, and he, he says that, that the leagues are still at a very early stage across the world. That that is certainly the truth, but what is the direction that they want to go, and and what are the steps that they're taking on a on a weekly and monthly basis to ensure that next year the league will be in a better place, or that 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 the the prof- professionalism may actually become a reality one year sooner because that's all you want to see is a, is a little bit of progress nobody expects this to be fixed overnight but the thing is becoming more broken by the day it seems Jenny Murphy on Twitter I know how hard the players work to get qualified deeply disappointed for them and for women's rugby in Ireland this result is a failing of the union their lack of ambition and poor support has led to this top of food chain I question do they care at all uh, that's pretty damning from somebody who's been in the system understands how the system works knows the players um, and Roy O'Connor makes a good point as well in The Independent this morning that um, in his first year in charge Ireland's women beat New Zealand at the World Cup and reached the semi-final in his second they won the Six Nations since it's been a dramatic fall from grace littered with own goals like the fiasco involving the Connacht team changing beside the bins at Donnybrook a few weeks ago that's uh, how from the arrival of New Sephora and obviously the good work was done before he arrived so he's not getting any of the credit for them reaching the World Cup um, or beating New Zealand in the World Cup since then it's just been this collapse like, and it's, it is a collapse to mm. go from at a World Cup, you beat the All Blacks, you reach a semi-final, and now you're not good enough to qualify. And it's like, this is not this is not football. Every every team in the world, every country in the world does not have a team. This is rugby, where we actually have a culture of playing the sport, and we were doing really well with that culture, and it's just been dismantled. It has been it has been dismantled. And like, pfft, yeah, I mean, come on, it's, it's actually a scandal when you think about how far we have fallen and how the the people in charge are taking no responsibility for that. Like that moment of beating New Zealand in the World Cup, winning the Six Nations, should have been the moment to spark what New Sephora spoke about in, in February, to, to spark the leagues, to spark the, the journey towards professionalism. It shouldn't have sparked an attitude which seems to me to have been, as ah, grand. It's grand. Like that was, it, it, at the, if you think back, right, it was a terrifying moment for the other sports bodies in Ireland because all of a sudden you had a successful international team who had the potential for some kind of a professional career. And what has happened is that the LGFA got their house in order, certainly from the, the sorry, the teams who play women's Gaelic football certainly got their houses in order and that sport has completely exploded. Mm. 
uh, which was like the most fertile recruitment ground for um, the women's international rugby team. And uh, it's just, it's gone nowhere. It's mad, absolutely mad. Let's move on because we've got three more things to get through here. Yeah, in the amber uh, this week, we've gone for Kerry GEA because uh, on Friday night, Jack O'Connor was appointed for the third time as a Kerry boss. And it kind of felt before the appointment that Jack O'Connor being, appointment, being appointed was maybe not the best move for Kerry. There, were, there was kind of people turning their nose up at the idea, including myself, I'm not going to lie. I thought, geez, Jack, Jack coming back, not sure about that now. But in the aftermath, a couple of days that have passed, thinking about this a little bit more, I think I might be on board with this. And I think that is the tone that is out there. I think there's like a tone, not so much of acceptance, but of quiet optimism about what Jack being back might actually do. Now, I think that there was a real feeling within the playing group that Peter Keane staying on might have been the best option. I think the feeling uh, amongst the the, the public in Kerry might have been that this Stephen Stack-led superhero unit might have uh, been the best option. But maybe in reality, the tried and trusted is exactly what they need. And there are little threads that we've seen throughout his career as as Kerry boss now that would give you hope. Like he he brought a certain element of steel into the into the squad in two thousand and four. Like bringing Paul Galvin and Ed O'Mahony into into proceedings was something that allowed Kerry to to bring a level of steel, not on Thrones level of, of steel or Armagh's level of steel, maybe, but but certainly a level of steel that Kerry hadn't had in in the early two thousands. Does he do that now again? And Paddy Talley is somebody who's been linked with the squad. And like we were talking about this uh, last week. And when that name was initially mentioned, I was like, God, no. Uh, but as, again, kind of like Jack O'Connor, the more time has gone by, I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll be straight up here. It wasn't the more time has gone by. It was like it, within four seconds, I, I'd done like a complete U-turn. I was like, you know what? Like if, if Jack O'Connor utilizes him right, that level of steel in the coaching staff or the level of steel that you'll get from a coach like Paddy Talley might be exactly what this carry defense needs. Now, I don't know... But there are enough ways you can talk yourself into this which would suggest that this is going to be a good move. But it is in the amber, as you can say. So I'm, I'm open to your re- like, open to you destroying that notion no, that it's going to no, be a good No, idea. no, no. Because I, um, I think this would have been red at one stage yeah. and now it's amber. And I'd say in three weeks' time, you're like, yes, this is amazing. Look Excited. what we've got. We've got a guy who's literally... We've got, like, we've put a team together who've literally been in the intercounty management uh, business for the last couple of years who know the lay of the land who would have been planning for Dublin automatically from in their roles because they knew they would have come up against them so we'll have endless reservoir of knowledge about them and now we have somebody from Ulster as well who completely taps into what's going on out there and somebody who understands the Kerry culture and yet at the same time is slightly outside that whole Kerry thing it's it's the perfect scenario for us that's what you're going to be like in three or four weeks time because yeah. Uh, you know, in in fairness, the Paddy Tally thing in our WhatsApp group, we were like, and you're like, actually, yeah, it's a good, yeah, yes, yeah, that's exactly what we need. Yeah, yeah, like, but this is this is off season hope, isn't it? Um, like the the one thing about uh, Jack O'Connor that w- would have maybe given you cause for concern before is just how the Kildare thing ended, and I I really think that the way they approached that Dublin game was just a sense of defeatism, and that that's what initially gave me a sense of of concern, but. You listen to what Jack O'Connor said on that now infamous Examiner podcast episode where he's like, I want to coach Manchester United again. Like, his approach to Kerry is not going to be the same as his approach with Kildare. No. And that is a harsh thing to say about Kildare. No, and no, it, sh- it shouldn't have been the case. Well, it's the truth. But uh, Jack, Jack O'Connor managing Kerry is different to Jack O'Connor managing Kildare. By the way, he got them to Division 1. And, like, worse things could have happened than Jack O'Connor going back is my current, is my current thought on this, this whole situation. At the start, I was like, no way. Now I'm like, he might actually win an All-Ireland for Kerry. All right, in green, we've got to fly through these because uh, Mark, Mark Lawrence is standing by and we're going to get you in two minutes. Well, you're loving the Premier League at the moment. M- make your case for, for, for why it's uh, the best league ever. Well, narrative, baby. Narrative, baby. Everything that we thought was true uh, is not true. It turns out Arsenal, no longer completely useless, that Mikel Arteta might know what he's doing, has a plan, has everybody fit at the moment, has Aubameyang interested. If you haven't seen any of the stuff from uh, that first half performance from Arsenal against uh, Spurs yesterday go and dig it out because the quality of football that they were playing and yet it's a matter of inches Harry Kane almost closes down or has, is essentially involved in, in key moments in a couple of the goals where at one end there's like he just needs to get a shot away or one more pass and it's going to be potentially one all but actually boom, eight seconds later ball's in the back of the net um, it's just really interesting evolution happening at Arsenal where they have young players very athletic, very technical, and you can see what he's trying to achieve. Man City absolutely crushed Chelsea. It was only 1-0, but they absolutely crushed him over the course of that game. It makes no sense whatsoever. What, what the hell? Where did Thomas Tuchel, where did that performance come from? And still, still Man City have problems. They could have crushed them more. 
They should have crushed them more. So it's not a done deal that we're going to just blah, blah, blah them into the winning of the title. Everybody is killing Manchester United at the moment for their performance against Villa. Not that many people watched the vast majority of the game. I went back and watched it. So it was on Sunday morning. I was like, oh, I'm going to watch this now. Safe in the knowledge of what's going to happen in the last 10 minutes. And really, like, there were about five instances where one more pass uh, or slightly better directed header goes into the back of the net and I would have been very scared as a Villa fan going 1-0 down at, at that stage. So I don't think it is the same as the previous inconsistencies that we've seen from the Solskjaer teams. Uh, who knows? They get beaten by Villarreal this week, all bets are off. That's a, that could be a trigger moment for them to, to move. I don't think they're as bad as everybody says. And if Ronaldo takes the penalty, it's one all. And everybody's like, oh, look, that's exactly why you have him in the team. If Ronaldo takes the penalty... I suddenly feel a little bit like Ireland versus Portugal, that there's a, there's a potential for a winner coming. But the penalty gets missed and they still create some chances and uh, Buendia is still pricking around on the edge of the penalty area. You're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, stop trying to dribble your way. Anyway, that was that one. Who I missed? Liverpool. Liverpool. <laughs> Liverpool. Jesus. Like, oh, Liverpool are 100% back and they're fully, it's like, this is going to be straightforward for them. Maybe it turns out Brentford are actually really good and so everybody can drop points against them too. So, uh, in the meantime, Brighton can go top tonight. Mm. I mean, <clears throat> here's hoping that it's a scratchy game and Aaron Connolly comes off the bench and scores the winner to send them top. Maybe, maybe that's not what he needs at this stage of his career. But uh, So, narrative, baby. Yeah, it's it's great. Like, the, the, the one concern you'd have is if, if, if there is this kind of mix of teams who are all on a similar level, if City just go on a run like they did last year in January and just pull away, then you'll have a, a crap into the title race. But right now, if every, if everybody's dropping points at a similar rate, then, then we've got a, a phenomenal title race. You uh, have a legitimate short. concern, though. The legitimate concern be, being that City could do that. Uh, like, I, that, just given it's completely based on, on the result on Saturday and I'm completely basing it on the scoreboard, but there was just something where it's like, okay, so, so City are going to win these games now. City are going to grind out these games and, and maybe the Tuchel spell over Pep for example might be weakening just a little bit and if City managed to scratch out those games 1-0 for example then they, they are going to pull away because I do think Manchester United will drop silly points like they did on Saturday I'm less convinced Liverpool will though and m- maybe like and I know Liverpool fans got their back up quite a bit and rightly so before the season started about them not being considered as title challengers I knew they I know they drew at Brentford at the weekend but you almost come away from the weekend thinking God, could this be a Liverpool Man City sort of situation when we get into the home stretch? We don't know yet. I mean, Chelsea are an outstanding side, a brilliant squad and an excellent manager. And I tipped them to, to win the Premier League beforehand. But if we're going to have an overreaction Monday here again, then who knows, may, maybe a City v Liverpool thing could be what we see later on. Okay. The last thing in the green we just want to mention is uh, Usyk, obviously, just in his third fight as a heavyweight beat, Anthony Joshua on Saturday night, uh, like 12 rounds uh, against uh, a world champion who weighed 19 pounds more than him, taller than him, bigger reach, Usyk wins on the day. I loved his post-match comments. He said, uh, when he was talking about all he had sacrificed, he said, I wanted to live. I wanted to take all four belts, but I wanted to take my kids to school. I wanted to plant trees. I wanted to water the apple trees. I wanted to see my wife more often. I spent three months in camp. I want to live. That is uh, Yusik, who is a poet, and I mean, maybe just a better boxer than Anthony Joshua, who has been shoved down our throats at every available opportunity. And yes, there is a disappointment about Joshua not winning at the weekend because we're missing out on a £200 million super fight. But maybe actually uh, Yusik is a better fighter than Anthony Joshua, full stop. He definitely was on Saturday night by, yeah. by a distance and should have knocked him out in the 12th round. But maybe this is actually better for, for the sport. Yeah. Finally, though, one last asterisk at the very, very end of this. Uh, you said the Premier League is... It's the big winner from the weekend. But is rugby not the big winner from the weekend? Oh, yeah. The uh, the All Blacks saved the sport by beating the Springboks at the weekend. There's a bunch of South African journalists who I follow on uh, on rugby Twitter. And they had all screen grabbed the various columns. Was it, it, was, was it, it was one of the old English players. They all kind of blend into one after a period of time uh, as they manufacture their column inches saying, it's really important that the All Blacks crushed South Africa this weekend to save the sport of rugby. And they didn't. They they had a scratchy last-minute penalty from the halfway line from uh, Jordy Barrett, one of the one of the Barretts, that uh, that won in the game. And, I, you know, you've got to say that uh, it wasn't particularly exciting to watch that second half. As a neutral, who just wants to see a little bit of... Now, in the first half, apparently, the, I missed that. The All Blacks were sensational in parts. And then 
somehow the Springboks just grabbed them and draw them back in. So look, the sport of rugby mm. wasn't, wasn't saved at the weekend. You're not a fan of South Africa? I mean, look, if you, if you want highly functional, very aggressive, big men grunting and groaning and um, being able to kick all their penalties, then yep, that's the sport for you, baby. Sign me up to winning rugby. That's this week's performance rankings. OTB AM's Pressure Rankings with Gillette. 11 minutes past eight. Mark Lawrence is standing by next. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The football pod with Paddy and Andy. The amount of people looking for Andy Moore and around Positano. It, it was all the rage. They're asking me what he's going to do next. When's the next episode out? The football pod's gone international. <laughs> Download the OTB Sports app and subscribe to the GEA podcast feed now. This is OTB Sports Radio. Were you much of a dessert man in the canteen or did you completely eschew any kind of uh, sweet things as a footballer? Absolutely not. Friday night in hotels, I used to look forward to it. I used to get um, rice pudding or um, you know apple crumble and custard and uh, you know I wouldn't care if Ronaldo or anyone walked through the door it was almost stopping me getting it to go so straight up for it it was um, something I really looked forward to Ronaldo wouldn't have stopped me getting my upper crumble on Friday night I promise you that Off the ball Saturdays from 1 on OTB Sports Radio listen live on the OTB Sports app OTB AM with Gillette put your best face forward with our new and improved razors OK, thanks to Gillette, we're celebrating the return to normality with a special prize of UEFA Champions League tickets to watch Chelsea against Malmo on October the 20th with flights and accommodation included. You can enter the, accommodation, the competition via Off The Ball's Twitter page. We'll be posting an image of a bearded sports person every day this week. Just respond to the post. Tell us who the person is for your chance to win this amazing prize. Put your best face forward with Gillette. The hashtag is best face forward. So who does that beard belong to? What uh, what handsome Italian midfielder is that? Uh, you can uh, get that on Twitter, at Off The Ball. Now, I'm delighted to say Mark Lawrenson is with us to look back on a really interesting weekend of Premier League football. Mark, I'm going to pile straight in, uh, and it's a pile-on at the moment, on Nuno at Spurs. Three games, the first three games of the season, Harry Kane only played in the third one. He'd managed the situation beautifully. They had nine points, things were going great. And now, it looks like he's not long for this world. How football is fickle. Well, I mean, that's why we love it, isn't it? So, and it's like anything. I think that, you know, when you're a Premier League manager, if you, if you win the first three games, you're absolutely brilliant and you're a god, and then you lose the next three and you, you, you're useless. So somewhere in the middle is probably where we're at. I mean, it's of paramount importance that they get Kane up and firing. Um, I wouldn't say he's looking like he's, he's sulking, but... There is obviously a, a little something in there eating at him, thinking I should be playing for Manchester City and I should be scoring at Chelsea and taking them apart like the rest of the, of the City team did. So that's interesting for Daniel Levy. Um, he obviously thinks he won the battle in terms of, well, he did win the battle in terms of stopping Kane going to Manchester City, but it looks like he stopped him playing at the moment because he's he only looks half of the player that, that he is and should be. And is Nuno the right man for this Spurs team? Well, 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 put it this way. Where would you go and who would you get if, if, if he isn't? And you can't, listen, as ruthless as uh, as Levy is, you, you can't jettison him now just, just after six games. You, you, and they've got some new players as well, haven't they? But I mean, the problem with them is they look awful defensively. But we all knew that. We, we all knew that. They've always looked awful defensively for ages and ages. And it's a team we can definitely get at. But on the day, they look... You know, they play really well and you think they're, they're really, really strong, but they're not strong enough. That Therein lies the problem. But so you, so you jettis and Nuno, where, where do you go? I mean, you know, who, 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 would, you, who would you go and get? Don't, don't give me Sam Allardyce. I'm, no, I'm only joking, obviously. Uh, like, it's, it's interesting watching Nuno's body language yesterday, like he's shaking his head the moment the third goal goes in and then in the aftermath of the game, he's like, I'd take full responsibility because the decisions were mm. not right according to the game plan. I won't name individuals, but the game plan was not right according to the players who were on the pitch. So he's damning towards himself. Like, Is that what you want to see as a player, that honesty, Mark? Or is it kind of lying on his sword a little bit too quickly? He's probably lying on his sword a little bit too quickly. But I, I get it. I think he's a, he's a very honest man, isn't he? Um, you know, and it, you know, with all the interviews he used to do when, when he was at, at Wolves, 
he was he was always very very honest but he was always very much like you know the players have done absolutely everything and if anybody's got things right it, it, it's himself so i think that's just that's your personality you can't sort of change your personality overnight but you know it's like this is the thing with, with the premier league i mean it, everybody gets carried away completely look i mean it was it was a great weekend in many many different ways because did we expect City to win at Chelsea? I would argue probably majority of the people no. Did we think that Liverpool would concede three goals at, at Brentford and end up with a 3-3? Three, three? You'd argue no. Did we think Man United would, would, would fall on the sword against Aston Villa? Oh, no. But that's that's why it's it's the best league in the world. But it, it, and it will still be, you know, the, the top four teams will still be the top four teams. I know obviously Brighton can get in there if they beat Palace tonight, but we, we all know who the top four teams are on. And, and long is it going to be so? Just one other one on, on Spurs, and I know you've already kind of touched on this, but but when it comes to Harry Kane, and feel mm. free to use the benefit of hindsight 100% of your mark, but now, knowing everything we know, should they have sold him, would it have been a good move for Spurs to, to cash in on Harry Kane at the summer? Yeah, and I, and I think uh, there are there are many different reasons. They need the money, because, because obviously with the, the refurb of the, of the ground, etc., there, there, there are millions, hundreds of millions in debt so that they've got to deal with that and it looks at the moment as though that there is a hangover with harry kane i think he'll, he'll be back and he'll be scoring because there's one thing about him he's a very honest person and very honest player so i don't i don't think that's an issue nuno will be talking to him uh little you know man-to-man chats etc but yeah um but it's it's done and it's and it's gone and they, they've sort of got to get on with it. But you know that you know maybe in three or four games from, from Tottenham turn it completely round. Everyone will be loving Nuno and everyone saying, "Oh, what a great decision for Harry not to go." It's it's just football, isn't it? But but it's it it is absolutely fascinating the behind the scenes and the politics about it all. Well, what about Arsenal? Because if there is a prototype for a club to turn things around pretty quickly, it is suddenly Mikel Arteta having put a couple of wins together and the team playing a discernible style of football, it's like, oh, yeah. he, he was always the right man all along. Whereas like three weeks ago, it was like, get Arteta out. Well, listen, for Nuno, put in Arteta. <laughs> it's completely reverse, isn't it? And it, they, they've done well, obviously, in, in winning the three games. But what are they? Were they Burnley away, uh, Norwich at home, and then obviously the, the big rivalry at the weekend against Tottenham. Look, if, if, if you're not fired up, as a player to play against your, your biggest rivals, and there are all sorts of problems. I always, I always think with, with Arsenal, we'll get this. We'll, they'll go seven, eight games unbeaten, and they'll lose three or four. I'm not sure when I look at them and people like Lacazette and Aubameyang, are they really there for the cause? I'm, I'm not sure that they are. And I think you know the, the kids in, in in this team who are coming through, look top, top, top players. If if they can get your Aubameyangs and Lacazettes playing with, with them. You know they will definitely improve. I don't think there's any doubt about that whatsoever. But you know, well, it could be in another six weeks we're going. You know, same old, same old Arsenal as we as we're now going. Same old, same old Tottenham. The the thing is, obviously, you, you mentioned the kids there. They're brilliant. The the concern would be how far can the kids take them in the short term? Because in the long term, they can yes. obviously take Arsenal to to the top four, no question. But will they be Arsenal players in the long term is probably the, the more quest, uh, pressing question. So what do Arsenal need to achieve this season to ensure that the likes of Emil Smith-Rowe and, and Bukayo Saka are, are still at the club next year and into the future? Top six. They've got to be. They've got to be in the top six. So that otherwise, you're giving these kids an excuse to knock on the manager's door and, and say they want to move. I mean, that actually doesn't happen because it's the, it's the kids' agents who knock on the manager's door and say, you know, he's, he's better than this club and we, we, we want him to move on, etc. So, but no, they've got, they've got to be top six. Um, anything else, and I think for the manager as well, anything else is fairly because they spent a lot of money. Um, and that There's no doubt. But I just think that since Adu got the job, basically, in charge of recruitment, They've been poorer. I mean, they, they, they made some very, very ordinary signings. Um, and that's the thing, you know, I, I always go on about this to everybody, which is second most important person at any football club is the guy ahead of recruitment. Because if he, if he gets it wrong, look, look at Barcelona. And you'd argue, look at Madrid as well. And I know that, the, you know, they're over a billion in debt, both of them. But look at the recruitment of the players. They're just not of the standard to be winning Champions League games etc so 
that's that's very much where Arsenal are at the moment. Do, do you accept that maybe because they're targeting clearly younger players under under 23s, that of mm. course they're not going to be title winning players just yet, but there is potential. Like even if you look at the the last window, of course, <clears throat> when you spend fifty million pounds on a player like Ben White, you expect uh, probably an immediate return. But even the likes of Tomiyasu and uh, and Ramsdale look to have come in and made an immediate impact, despite the fact that they too have have been signed for for their future end products. Yeah, well, that but that but it's all about the balance, isn't it? it it's all it's all about the players that you've, you've you've spoken about, and you know ones that are already there in terms of giving them the experience. And look, I mean, you know, I think I, I like Arteta. I, I like what he's he's trying to do. I think it's just really really difficult for him because he's under a, a, immense pressure. And but listen, Ar- Arsenal as a football club. Really, since Arsene Menger walked out the door, they have they have not been the same. And you might even say the last eighteen months of of, of Arsene's time as well at mm. at Arsenal, they, they weren't the same. And you know, it's it's cyclical at, at, at this level. You just you just get a couple of things wrong um, because of the standard and the quality of of, of the other teams who, who we all know. And um, and all of a sudden you look very very ordinary. But they, they've got these these kids look really top players. I'm, you're a little bit low to make to, to go on about them too much because we we know what can happen with with, with a lot of youngsters got massive praise and then they go off the boil a little bit. But I just get the feeling that um, the two two young boys who are outstanding yesterday. I think they're they're going to be real real top players. Um, last point on this: Aubameyang is mm. is actually one of the most important uh, of all of the players at all of the clubs in the Premier League. He's one of the most important individuals because if he turns it on and gets back to some kind of level of form and shows some leadership, then that transforms the team. But if he's the arriving late in his supercar, revving the car outside, not available for fixtures, not really phoning it in, making all that money, it it, it poisons the well. So there's very few yeah. individuals who have as much power or influence. Oh, absolutely! I mean, all right, it was it was myth because he they played him a lot on the on the left of a of a three of a three. But I mean, it, it it's down to yourself, absolutely, totally. It's down to yourself. And look, you know, if you get twenty players, and they're all they'll all be different, and there will be the odd one who's probably a superstar, and and he's not particularly bothered about if he's ten minutes late for training and all those kind of things. But it's it, it's important, you know, because. Because then the young kids look at him, and think, well, you know, he doesn't bust a gut to, to get him for training, and he's and he's always last minute. And I, I, I know someone uh, who works for the BBC who interviewed him last year, and she was she was kept waiting for four hours to interview him. And of course, you know, the media guy Arsenal was kind of going, well, he's on his way. He's a little bit of problem and all that kind of thing. He obviously just didn't really want to be there, and in the end, was almost cajoled in, into doing the interview. Well. You know that for me is just how are you how are you brought up? You know how it's all about respect. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you haven't really got that respect, then I, I'm not quite sure. When when you look at these players, you kind of get thinking. As soon as he has a, a an off day, you're thinking, well, this is to be expected because just this is the way that he is. Um, and I'm I'm not just picking him out. There, there, there will be lots of players at lots of different football clubs who are who are exactly. The same, and that's why, again, go back to recruitment. Not just your ability, but you know, are, are you are you a good bloke? Um, when things go against you, do you actually knuckle down and try even harder? You know, are you great in addressing with with all the players and all the younger players, etc.? Or are you just playing for yourself? And I think when you look at one or two of the Arsenal players, I get the impression that that's exactly what they are. Why? Why did? Why did? Jurgen Klopp not take Aubameyang when he could have taken him. He knew him. He knew him absolutely, one hundred percent, inside out, and never ever took him. We know we know on his day he's an outstanding footballer. It was never even mentioned that Aubameyang would go to to Liverpool. And I think Jurgen Klopp looked at him and thought, yeah, top top player, dressing room, not sure. He he was interviewed after the game on on Sky Sports beside Emil Smith Rowe. And he said, Arsenal can be proud of these boys while putting his arm uh, around Smith Rowe. Uh, they are great guys and doing well. I'm happy that my kids will go to the Hale End Academy and maybe one day will be like him. Uh, like, I mean, when I'm looking at that market, it suggests to me somebody who, who is a, a team player, somebody who is hugely respectful of his teammates. Um, yeah, well, from the, well let, let's wait and see. 
let, let's wait and see. I don't, I don't think that we've seen that so far from him. We, you obviously saw it in the interview. I don't think we've seen that so far with him. And I think, I think he's just a player who, who very much plays for himself. And just go back to the point, you know, what, why didn't we Jurgen Klopp take him when when he needed a striker and when, you know, on a few occasions in in the Champions League uh, with Liverpool, um, he, he took him apart. So that's what I would always look at. And as I say, that's it, it's a massive thing now. There's so many, so many, you know, superbly talented players, but it's a little bit in the end. It, it's it's what's happening between the, the rears that, that matters as much as anything. It'd be interesting to see if he, if his if the penny has dropped at this stage of his career, uh, or if he is the disruptive force that we've seen him over the last couple of years. Can I move on to Liverpool? Because what yeah. what level of concern do you have when the first choice defence with Fabinho playing with Henderson playing concedes three away at Brentford? Is it just one of those things that happens over the course of a season, or does it suggest that they haven't quite got back to the level of defending that they had two seasons ago? I think I'd go. I think I'd go back to the, the former point rather than the latter. They just um, they weren't they weren't competitive enough, basically, in, in that department at the weekend. But you know, you know, all, all clubs go through this, and um, you know, as I say to you, you, you can only talk about your own time as players. I mean, you know, the so-called old conquering team of, of the eighties. I remember going to Coventry and getting stuffed four nil. You know, we were absolutely hopeless, and we're—I think we're in the middle of an outstanding run. It, it just happens, and and it's also—it's a case of how you react to it and how you deal with it. I mean, I think Joe Fagan was probably the manager then, genial Joe, and he and he came in to the dressing room and and he, he looked at me and Hanson afterwards, and he he basically went, "Oi, you two buggers, promise me that won't happen again." And we've gone, no, Joe, it, it won't. We were awful. We were, we were horrendous. Little Terry Gibson scored a hat-trick against us, I'm pretty sure, on that day. So, you know, you do, and, and football people with experience know these things happen. And I think Klopp didn't make a great deal about it. He said, yeah, we weren't particularly good defensively. I don't think he'd be shouting them out in the dressing room. He, he will be very much, especially with City coming up in terms of the next league game, would be very much kind of, well, it's happened, nothing we can do. It's not normality for us. We are completely different. But they just they just had a bad day and that's that's the way that it's dealt with. Uh nineteen eighty three, I've just quick Google there, that was uh, Terry well, Gibson's hat trick against Liverpool. Yeah, well we, me and Hansen tried to, to blame Grobelar, but for once he wasn't he was blameless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so n- no concerns really long term about this. It's just uh, no, the the league's no, a long no, season no. and yeah, yeah, and he's got this. And he's got they've now got loads of cover in there as well, haven't they? So no, 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 no concerns, no concerns about that. I mean, listen, City could have been two, three, four up at uh, at Chelsea, couldn't they? And then all of a sudden we're going, oh, you know, this super organised defence that doesn't give anything away, and like what's happened to them on Saturday lunchtime? So it is football. It is that that is just the way that it is. And when you get you know these the four outstanding teams, which they are. That there will there will be some mad results, and um, you know you, you might argue at the moment that the, the top four teams in the Premier League, all right, take Brighton out of this, but the top four teams in the Premier League, they're probably the, the top four teams in European, maybe even world football. Are they not? I, I can't think of any other teams that are that are better than them. It'll be interesting to see how Paris Saint Germain meld that whole group of players they have together, and it... well, listen. Just because he's he's now moaning and Bappy about everything, isn't he? He's now moaning that uh, that, that that your man won't pass to him. Neymar, Not yeah, messy. yeah, Neymar, and it's like that ain't good. If 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 he's doing that publicly, that is not good. Now, I, I know I think he probably wanted to try and get away, didn't he, in the window? Um, and there and there are obviously certain ways in which you, you, you can make it difficult for the football club and make it easier for yourself to to want to go, but. It, it's not a good idea turning around to your teammates. Well, going public about it, you might have a word with him, and and you know, and you know what the hell's happening and stuff like that. But um, not good once you go public. Uh, the Chelsea Man City game really, really interesting because Chelsea felt like they had this power over Man City over the last three or four games since mm. Tuchel has arrived in the big games. 
and it just completely evaporated at the weekend. Man City were clearly the better team and probably should have beaten them by much more. Completely outplayed them. And out, not just outplayed them, but outthought them rather than outfought them. Um, most definitely. But that's that, it's, it's their DNA, City. That's that's the way they are, aren't they? And they could do... I mean, the, the, way, the way they control the game and control the ball and, and control everything that happens is... is you know, just shows they're a really, really outstanding team. But I don't, I don't change, think it changes the landscape dramatically. They go to Liverpool, obviously next next Sunday, which again will be yet another fascinating game. Um, but it's it's still these top four teams, and whether they've had a good weekend or whether they've had a bad weekend, it will still be it will still be these four teams fighting it out. And you know the results against each other. I think are going to be absolute paramount. To be honest with you, so it's 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 an even bigger result for, for City than than it sounds. You know, one nil at Chelsea, brilliant, but one nil at Chelsea means that City have got three points that Chelsea cannot get, and I think that's the way this season is going to be with the top four. Why has it gone from a, a chaotic state of not knowing who's going to be in the top four to what seems like a very exclusive club already this season? Money, it's quite simple. Money, wages, everything, everything about it. That's that's just the way it is. That you know they've they, they've left all the they've left your Tottenham's and, and and your Arsenal's and other teams in their wake, and they've just they just signed bigger and better players. Um, which is it's not a great worry for the, for for the for the Premier League, but I think it's a great worry generally if you take it all the way through into you know the lap, the bottom six teams, and and you look at the moon. And Norwich haven't got a point, have they? Um, you know, and I, and I think you kind of you kind of looking at it's the, the problem is is the, is the gulf now between Premier League and the Championship has got even bigger. And before you throw um, Brentford at me, Brentford, I think, and I, I think I said at the start of the season, I think they win a lot of games because of the way they are. I think they've got an outstanding manager, and the boy Ivan Tony up front is a, is a proper proper player, but but also the old play. In a certain way, they, they know the role, etc., and they're going to win games. I mean, you may as well relegate Norwich now, aren't we? Because th- they've got absolutely no chance of staying up, and it's going to be, you know, an extra one um, as well, going by extra two going with them. But it it, it, it is money, and I, I know it's easy to say, but that's 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 what it is. I mean, you look, you just look at the likes of Liverpool, even looking at Liverpool and the players that they let let out on on loan, and. Basically, you know, majority of them would absolutely cruise the championship, and they are relatively, <coughs> excuse me, inexperienced. But you know, the bigger the club, the bigger the squad, um, the more money you have, and yeah, it's it, it's money. And and why all of a sudden of Barcelona and Madrid started to look very very weak? I know Madrid obviously are right at the at, at the top, but. Um, it's only because they've kept on. They're, they've managed to keep hold of their bigger stars, and obviously with Barcelona, that they are just in a, in a mess. But didn't they give the job of recruitment to one of the former players who had to pack in? Can you remember that? Wasn't it? Wasn't he? Was he one of the? He was the left back, wasn't he? I can't remember his name now. Abidal. So it's Monday. Yeah, Barcelona. Abidal yeah. was 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 there for a while, and then um, I think didn't. I don't know. Is he still there? Certainly, he was very close. No, to I think well. It, he might still be there, but he's not doing the same job. So he, he couldn't do it. You know, he, he just, obviously, you, you can be a player and, and, and you can look at other players, but sometimes if you then have to make a decision on which one of the three that you take, if, if you are in charge of recruitment, if you get it wrong, you can get it spectacularly wrong. And that's what's happened to to um, to Barcelona. And, and that's why probably Eric Abidal lost his job. Um, let's talk briefly about Manchester United because obviously the the constant knock on Solskjaer since he got the job was that he doesn't have the experience of managing at this level. Is that increasing? Should have now. Well, he does. He's he got a long old time at it. He's he's had much yeah. longer than not much longer, but he's had longer than everybody else apart from Ferguson, uh, who's been there since Ferguson. So when when does the when does the decision get made, or or what has to happen next? Um. Well, I don't know. Did they play next week? They'll probably go and beat them. So it's like, you know, return to the status quo. So I just think with him, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think he knows his best team even yet. And I don't, I don't look at you. Don't look at 
the recruitment there. So I'm sorry, I'm boring you to death with recruitment, but you don't look at recruitment there and you kind of go, oh yeah, well that's like, you know, an, a, another piece in the jigsaw. And you, you look at some of the players that you signed and you're kind of thinking, where is, where is he going to play and, and, and when? Is he going to play? I mean, the, the the Dutch boy that they signed. I mean, what what was all that about? That 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 seemed to me as though I will sign him because we'll stop somebody else signing him. He doesn't he doesn't get a look in, does he? So um, and that, I think that there therein lies the problem with with, with Manchester United. Yet yeah, they win an awful lot of games, but we'll still look at them and think, can you play poorly and win? And I don't think they can. They've got Villarreal on uh, Wednesday night in the Champions yeah. League. And Villarreal drew nil all at the weekend where Real Madrid have a really strong European pedigree. The game is at Old Trafford, so that that's um, <coughs> helpful from Solskjaer's perspective, at least for the first 15 minutes when the crowd are fully behind them. Yeah. But if things start to go yeah. against them, all of a sudden there's the ooh and the uh, and the expectations. So uh, these games are... Every single one of these games again becomes a referendum on him after a performance like the one at the weekend. Yeah, it does. But am I sat here thinking they won't qualify for the later stages of a Champions League? No. And I, and I get your I get your um you think about the opposition as well. Villarreal, I mean, you know, they'd be very very comfortable on the ball, etc. But that's you know you're you're at a massive club, um, and again. You know, you you always. Go, I mean, behind the scenes, the, the, there will be discussions about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. There will, there will abs- absolutely totally be. But then you, you look around, and you, you say, who, "Who would we get?" And are you going to still chuck Conti at me? Is he still? Is he still out of a job? He is. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Um, maybe you. Go on. Maybe you go for a Brendan Rodgers or or. Oh, behave yourself. <laughs> behave yourself. No. No. Why not? There's no, no. Why? Liverpool. You, you, you give me mm, inherited a inherited an outstanding team, but not not for me. I, you know, know him as a person that, but no, no, not for me. It's a, it's a little bit. I mean, I think with Brendan, it's I think it's a little bit about him as much as anything else. So, no, and I, you know, listen. The other thing is, imagine imagine Brendan goes and loses the first three games. Former Liverpool manager, no chance. Okay. Um. <laughs> that, that, that shut well, me up for a minute. Well, it's the, look, the list is the same as the list for all the jobs at the moment. Yeah. There's Roberto Martinez. There's uh, you know Zidane. Well, there's another one. Would Zidane? <clears throat> would Zidane, who has won Champions Leagues, is he exactly what they need? Because no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think he is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think you know Zidane was really, really I mean, fabulous player, one of the best I've ever seen. But really, really fortunate in terms of the players that he had at his disposal. So no, I, I think, I think, I think you know any of those. It's it's the same kind of problem that they've already got. So no, I, I don't see that. I can see Conte a little bit because I think he'd come in and he'll be he'll be strict and it will definitely be be his way. So. Um, I don't. I don't really see anybody else. I mean, Brendan, Brendan Rodgers is, you know, did well at Celtic, which you would obviously expect, um, and he's done. A, he's done a good job at, at Leicester. And by the way, if you're talking about a team with recruitment, that's that's a really outstanding mm. um, job they've been doing in terms of recruitment. But no, I don't. I, I don't see them going going to Man United. All right. All right, so he gets the job till the end of the season, almost irrespective. Then is that like by by default, Solskjaer stays till the end of the season? No, 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 because um, there is, there is another there is another side to this, which of course is is the owners, and not so much the owners in terms of making a decision about the manager, but if 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 they don't get in the Champions League knockout stage, you're talking about the share price, which is then completely different. I'm I'm pretty sure, and I, but I don't know the exact figures. But when they sign Ronaldo, I, I bet the share price rocketed. So. You know, happy days. So they're probably at the moment not particularly bothered too much because they look at it completely differently. And you know, they're allowed to because they own the football club. But um, no, it's just if, if they if they don't get in the Champions Champions League knockout stages, I think that's that's a, a big thing against the manager. But then you know, if, if they're still in the top four and they're only three points away from from actually you know 
being top of the league in terms of the Premier League, yeah. I think I think it'd be very very harsh to, to sack him. And it, listen, it's just it's one of those weekends. It's been absolutely fascinating. Yeah. But as I said at the start of it, you know, th- three of those results you just would not have predicted. And that's why we love it, Mark. Good stuff. Thanks yeah. a million. Pleasure. Cheers, that's Mark Lawrence and giving us his thoughts on a really interesting weekend of Premier League activity. OTBIM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Let's run through the sports pages uh, at 8.40 this morning. Kane unhappiness <coughs> remains major hangover for Spurs season. A USA dominate Europe to clinch impressive Ryder Cup victory. Roy McIlroy in tears during interview following Ryder Cup singles win and they're as bad as you'll see this season. That's Graham Sooners talking about Spurs. Ireland's women were set up to fail by the women's rugby structure, says Fiona Hayes. We'll bring you that a little bit later on on the show as well. The uh, competition, right. I've given you another chance to enter our competition this morning with thanks to Gillette as we celebrate the return to normality with a special prize of UEFA Champions League tickets to Chelsea against Malmo on the 20th of October with flights and accommodation included. You can enter the competition through the Off The Ball Twitter page. We're going to post an image of a bearded sports person every day this week. Just respond to the post and tell us who the person is for your chance to win this amazing prize. So who does this beard belong to if you're watching the show this morning uh, you should be able to tell who that is uh, put your best face forward with Gillette that the hashtag is best face forward the uh, sports page is very quickly for you this morning the Herald Spurs shot down IRFU must take share of blame for exit that is um, those pieces there Guardiola's silver lining catches Chelsea cold an emotional Rory wins but USA stormed victory 19-9 Rory's tears um, what, 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 what's that one of those five pictures of the same thing. All right. No, it's not. <laughs> don't, don't have that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the examiner this morning. It's a picture of Roy McIlroy's tears and uh, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. Hidon Nuno as fog clears for Arteta and Arsenal. Guardiola, Bernardo Silva, one of Europe's best. And Johnny Nicholson's asking the question, how long before Man United pull the eject lever? We don't know. We don't know. I mean, every time we've been in this scenario, a good result has happened. They've pulled it out of the fire. So maybe maybe Laura's right. They're going to hammer Villarreal during the week. The Times, London, Europe reduced to tears. Uh, Norris hands Hamilton win. Fury versus Joshua won't happen. Be lucky to get 200 quid, AJ told. That's the back of the sun. 200. The millions crossed out. AJ told he'd be lucky to get hundreds versus Fury, but fallen champ still wants bout without belts. Uh, Rory lost ball, B-A-W-L. Yep, we're having, that. We're having that. Okay. McElroy tears as Europe walloped. That's uh, Lou's top Mercs. Top Mercs? Mercs? Mercedes Mercs? Yep. yep. Uh, big no no for Nuno. Yep. No no for Nuno. Three, three big ticks for me this morning. Okay, so that's the sun uh, back in our good books. <clears throat> but I think tab of the morning to you is this one Lake Michigan. <laughs> yep, tab of the morning to you indeed. Uh, well, that how is. Do you do? Tab of the morning. Rory's tears after a record rider route for Porrick's off-colour team. Uh, how, how did you get a free pass from everybody this morning? That's the, the general consensus. Uh, I can't wait to get another shot at it. Rory resurgent, but red tide washes over Harrington's European team in record. They've got better gear, the Yanks. Mm. Like, it's not close. No, the, well, do they? Yeah, much better. The, the jumpers with the names on them, they were cool. What about the shoes? I didn't see the shoes. Viewed them were wearing. Were they all wearing them? Nathan will fill us in in just a moment, but certainly Justin Thomas uh, and his and his shoes were like I presume that they all had some sort of stars and stripes on the shoes, but it just like I mean, it looks it doesn't look good. It looks clownish. The, some some of the American gear, I think. I, like the hat looks great, and the top hat uh, like the top half looks great. I was at the hat looks a bit maga. Okay, well I mean let's let's it just definitely looked a bit maga. I was like, is that they've just they've gone with red hats? I, uh, That's an interesting. It's an interesting fashion statement, right? Right now, at this precise moment in the history of the planet, America going red hat at the Ryder Cup was like, if only, okay, that's your choice. But it all depends on who the hat is on. Uh, like obviously, removing the, the MAGA connotation that you've made, I didn't put that together. But like some people are just hat guys and some people aren't. Like John Ram, for example, is a hat person and he looks fantastic in his hat, whereas other people just don't look as good in their hats. I just think this gear... Which is kind of washed out m- fawn, isn't particularly powerful on the last day, is it? That's the European beige. It's a bit blando. You're telling me that like Patrick blando. Cantlay is staring at that and saying, "That's not that's not scaring me. I'm well, gonna it, I'm gonna it, hammer you." It's not exactly a war color, is it? 
Oh, yeah. I've got a little bit of yellow and a little bit of blue and a little bit of beige. What, what, so what, what, what is war colour? What, what would you go with? The, uh, the design your dream Ryder Cup uniform there. Well, the Yanks, oh, the Yanks gear is always better. Like, it's just, it's red on the last day. Red, it's red at the top. And, uh, you know, tiger, tiger red. It's like, yeah, let's go for this. Like, do, do you go, like, full all blacks on it? Is that like the, is that the only thing more terrifying than, well, than the only, red and finally? I mean, could anybody get away with that now in golf after wasn't it? Um, who's the most travelled man in world sports? The South African golfer who wore black and sucked the energy in on the sun on the last day. I'm having a brain fart here. Um, you can look that one up for me if you want there for a second. Uh, and then the Irish Times Europe slumped to record loss defeat in Parma marks low point for Irish women's game. We got smashed admits Lloris of Derby defeat and uh, pragmatism behind Kerry decision is Michael Clerkin's piece there. You're talking about Kerry player. Kerry player, of course, yeah. Uh, crying shame. Uh, Rory McIlroy's tears make the back page of the all the papers this morning. And Ireland's flop needs to be watershed moment. That's Rory Keane's piece in the mail. And Rory's four brawl. Rory's four ball. Four, God, I'm sorry. Jesus. Rory's four ball is the front page of the uh, the star this morning. Emotional McElroy breaks down after a tough week, but vows to come back as he hails teammates and Euro thrashed, which could also have been top of the morning to you. McElroy left in tears as USA smash points record. If only they'd worn different colour clothes. Well, I'm just saying, it's like... Like, it could have been so different. Like Our uniforms are crap. I, I, they are. Like I'm, not, just, the, you can, I'm, I'm not saying that's why we lost. No wonder Project Harrington's not getting his legacy tarnished. He could do nothing about the... 8.47 this morning. Nathan Murphy, good morning to you. Morning, lads. Who's got the better gear? Oh, the US, without question. Our gear's crap, basically. It is, isn't it? It's not pretty. It's uh, insanely expensive as well, it seems. Uh, I do remember at previous Ryder Cups going into the merchandising tent and having a wander around. And if you want to get the official replica... Uh, you're probably looking at maybe up in a grand for one of those nice European jackets. What? <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? You're joking me. I'm not. Wow. Get online there. Check out uh, the Ryder Cup website. They might even have some of them left. Yeah. It's uh, not it, a grand anymore, an Nathan. You, no an one's paying a grand for that crap this week. <laughs> <laughs> no. Our boys took one hell of a beating, eh? Yeah. So let, let, let's start with Harrington's legacy because there's, there's two schools of thought which you can see this debate uh, happening on Twitter. I talked about it a little bit earlier on. One is that, look, Harrington's legacy is secure. He's one of our best and most beloved sports people and fair enough, that will always be true. However, he did open, as Owen pointed out earlier on, he did open the Pandora's box of the legacy question by saying it was, this was important to him. And we've seen Nick Faldo's legacy ruined by a bad Ryder Cup experience. Not ruined, but like certainly he became a figure of fun for a period of time and then his reputation got restored by him being mm. excellent as a, as a commentator. And I have no doubt Harrington's going to end up in the commentary box at some point in the next few years and he will be absolutely sensational. So, But in the meantime, there is a short window here where people are going to start saying, did Harrington make all the right decisions? Could it have been a bit closer? Like, sure, fair enough, the best team won. But did it need to be such a paddling? I think over the coming weeks and months, that's what Potter Carrington will be thinking long and hard about. He said afterwards last night that he could sleep easy because he felt he made all the right decisions, that he had no regrets. But one of the great things about Harrington is that he's one of the most analytical minds going and he loves to talk about his analytical mind. So I suspect when we hear interviews in a week's time, in three months' time, in six months' time, in five years' time, he will have different angles to what he did. It felt as though Harrington never really put his stamp on this team that Europe have a pre-prepared plan. They are so well organized in the sort of post-McGinley era. They push everything to a T. They don't leave any stone unturned. Everything that these players need is put there. And it felt as though Thomas Bjorn could have been the captain this week or the Westwood could have been the captain this week, that the sort of peculiarities of Potter Carrington never really came to the fore. And that's what makes Harrington so brilliant is that he's not just like everybody else whereas this European Ryder Cup team the way they went about it it felt like anybody could have captained and I'm sure one of the things he's thinking about is for three years of preparation uh, what he sacrificed probably from his own game over the last two three years to prepare for this you're right they could have just rocked up and probably would have won nine points for everything that was put into this so 
I, I don't think he did a huge amount wrong. I think it's different from Nick Faldo, where Faldo, it was just shambolic and you know embarrassed himself in many ways from his uh, speech ahead of the tournament to some of his selections to the way they played. It's just general arrogance around the whole thing. Likewise, Darren Clark made a massive error of judgment with what happened with Danny Willett. With Harrington, the odds were stacked against them. Best American side of all time. This is the American dream team, essentially. And this is Europe at maybe the weakest point they've ever been. And you go through the key things that a Ryder Cup captain has to do. So one of the first decisions they make is how many wildcard picks do you want? And you can put out there as a stroke of genius that Steve Stricker went with six wildcards and Harrington only went with three. Harrington's justification was, well, you're probably always going to pick seven, eight, and nine anyways. And that's exactly what Steve Stricker did. Then you look at the wildcard picks themselves. I mentioned this pre-tournament. Harrington couldn't say it, but he must have been so frustrated and disappointed that nobody made a run at this. There was no controversy. Yeah, Justin Rose or Ian Poulter or Shane Lowry, none of them have been winning tournaments. None of them have really given him a headache ahead of this. And after that, there was really nobody. There was nobody else in the mix. Even a Francesco Molinari, and I'm sure we'll talk about what you can take from a Ryder Cup. Francesco Molinari at the last Ryder Cup won five matches, every single match, and wasn't even in the running, it felt, for a wild card. And then that next generation of Bob McIntyre of Scotland, who started the season well, who just faded away. So I think in terms of his team selection, you can't put a huge amount on Harrington for that. That was the best that Europe have to offer. And then there's what happened during the week. I thought press conference-wise, he was rock solid. The pairings are the one thing I think we look back on. And, you know, was there a way over the weekend that they could have wrestled this back and... Saturday morning is probably the one you look at and think at that stage, they're six, two down. You got to do something. And it felt as though they never deviated from the plan at all, that this was something that was written down weeks, months ago. Here's how we're going to line up. Whereas there was too many players just not playing well enough, whether it was Casey or Hatton or Westwood Fitzpatrick, the Shane Lowry had to go out. I cannot believe Shane Lowry didn't play a foursomes match at the Ryder cup. Uh, maybe a Tommy fleet would have to be out there. I think he should have played Rory on Saturday morning. I know Rory <laughs> stunk the joint out, but I think if they were to win this, they needed Rory McIlroy playing well and needed to give him every possible opportunity to play well. And well, I think once Saturday morning was done, it was really done. But I'm sure there's lots of little things that Harrington would change. But overall, I don't think the result was ever really in doubt. This is a stupendously talented It's American the size team. of the result, really. And we were talking mm. about this earlier on, the Alan Shipnuck piece about how America are going to dominate for a decade. It feels like Shipnuck got it uh, a little bit early, but it feels like they are going to dominate for a decade, given the quality of, of players they have, the players, quality of players they have coming through. And uh, as you say, where is that next generation of European golfer who are going to win tournaments coming from? Well, there's a bigger issue. Remember, this is the PGA Tour against the European Tour. And the European Tour, because of the COVID issues, is in a difficult spot right now in terms of the prize money, which means world ranking points, which means these European players aren't given the opportunities to get into the big tournaments, to move up the world rankings and get themselves into Ryder Cup reckoning. So there may not be a huge turnover in this European side over the next two years. You would expect it. We've seen the last of Poulter and Westwood. But I would expect that seven, eight, nine of these Europeans will be back because somebody like Shane Lowry, for example, because of winning a major, is in every major championship, every World Golf Championship. He's one of the few Europeans who can sit down next week and plan out his entire 2022 and play whatever tournaments he wants. So there's sort of deep-rooted problems in the European Tour. And you look at that team, the only young players in that side are John Ram and Victor Hovland. They didn't come the old-school, traditional European Tour route. They came through the American college system, the exact same as all these Americans did. None of them came through challenge tour, European tour, winning tournaments, building themselves up like that. That route just doesn't seem to be happening uh, for the best young European players. So the next decade of domination may well happen. This was on home soil. For all the different stats of European dominance, the home team almost always wins the Ryder Cup. And the Americans were very conscious of that last night, that to really prove that they are a great Ryder Cup team, they have to go away from home and win. They have to go to Rome where Europe can set up the course that they want. Last Ryder Cup, it was the Americans who took a beating. They seem to have managed to regroup. They've got a really good, likable team for all that Europe sold the team spirit thing. And it seems as though that stood right till the end. The Americans also got on really well. And so much was focused on Brooks and Bryson. But the other 10, the other 10 seemed to click instantly. All seemed to like each other. All were pulling in the right direction. And, Steve Stricker seemed to be a, I don't know, a sort of Carlo Ancelotti type figure who just 
knew how to bring the best out of brilliant talent and not interfere too much in what they're doing. And they were so angry. They were so passionate, so up for it. And maybe that just comes from it being a home rider cup. But is there something different when it comes to the edge of this American golfer as well? Is the is the collegiate system so competitive that they come into the professional game with the perfect mindset for Ryder Cup time? I think when you have thousands of people just chanting USA, USA, USA <laughs> behind you, that you feel a little bit emboldened. Like uh, I know um, Justin Thomas in particular has split opinion over the weekend for his antics and uh you know boozing on the uh, first tee or having half a beer on the first tee and just is generally trying to stir up the crowd and how maybe it was a bit childish and like we rarely see that justin thomas you know justin thomas in some ways is a forgettable enough type character but a Ryder cup does that to players it brings out a, a very different side of them and the americans seem to be able to embrace it they seem to know that there's very few europeans here we can kind of do what we want this is our town and we'll run it whatever way we want to run it and the europeans couldn't respond like maybe the Europeans needed to play a little bit dirtier it may be Monday Tuesday Wednesday they needed to be stirring the pot around Bryson and Brooks constantly but they never got under their skin and like the Ryder Cup is such a strange event there's so much analysis afterwards about what makes a good Ryder Cup player and you know should you be more emotional the team spirit tapping into it Dustin Johnson went five and zero this week he won every single match with Dustin Johnson there's no emotion there's no nothing there's no overthinking he just rocks up and plays golf. Mm. So <laughs> we read an awful lot into the Ryder Cup, what it happens, what it means. The Americans had the better golfers who played the way they played all year. Every one of these golfers, if you're watching PGA Tour on a Sunday night, you have seen all of these yeah. golfers consistently win, win big tournaments, yeah. hold big putts. And I mentioned last week, three Europeans have won in the PGA Tour this year, John Ram, Rory McIlroy, and Seamus Power. So... The Europeans have, and that's where it's at. The PGA Tour is where it's at. I'm sure people have said they've been contending on the European Tour, but the PGA Tour is where the elite are, and the Europeans have been dominated by the Americans over the last year. What's the score if Paul McGinley is the Ryder Cup captain for Europe? Uh, I, I don't see, like, I don't see Europe winning it. Maybe they win a few more points uh, here and there, but, but maybe they don't. Maybe. It, it, here, it's an impossible question. I, I think we're saying that you're suggesting then that Harrington didn't do something, that there was something about the preparation that Harrington. Well, all managers didn't do things do differently. He's not suggesting done. that. Uh, no, that's not. It's not really. It's like he might have picked a different team. He might have picked different. He, there, the setup would have been different because no two rivers, the same river is never the same. Well, like, actually, that's that's the point I'm making. I wonder, would it have been? It feels as though. What the European Tour have done is taken the McGinley template, which worked so brilliantly, and replicated it and replicated it and replicated it. And they were right to take as much of that as possible. But actually, did they allow enough for the individuality of a Paul Harrington to come through in terms of how he wanted to run the show? Like, it feels as though this European team, and I'd say they'll try and continue the same way into Rome in two years' time. So I, I have no idea. Maybe they wouldn't would a couple more points, but I don't think any European team was winning this. That's why almost every prediction was an American victory. Yeah, it's a like it's very hard to decipher what exactly the captain contributes in terms of the the, the scoreboard. Like, what is he doing to hold the team back or, or push the team forward? And the bottom line here, from what you're saying, Nathan, it seems is that Harrington's mo was to get out of the way of the players. So would you be fully of the belief, of the belief that if Harrington had this back again, and as you say, in, in a few years' time, if he's thinking about this properly, he will be thinking to himself, I, w- I would just wish it was more of Podrick Harrington there rather than me just doing my best to, to stay out of the way of, of uh, talented golfers. Well, all of this is guesswork because nothing has really come out as of yet. And la- Watching the press conference last night, it was almost... Uh, too jovial from the Europeans. There was a lot of laughing and joking and again, a lot of talk about the team ethic and how much they bought into this and how much I love my teammates and all of that. So maybe there won't be any cracks. Maybe all these European players in three, four years will say, you know, that was a brilliant Ryder Cup. Potter did very little wrong. We were just run over by this brilliant American team. But I don't think from Harrington's point of view, he he's going to be thinking about this for the rest of his life, about could I have done this slightly differently? Could I have done that? It, like, did he give, did he give them enough space? Like, did he create an atmosphere that could get the best out of Rory McIlroy? Did he put too much on McIlroy's shoulders? Did he not put enough on McIlroy's shoulders? Like, we're never quite sure with Rory what's best. It seems he wants the emotional energy of it, but then actually quite often he can't cope with the emotional energy of it. And when one of your best players 
isn't playing well and everyone expects so much from like it can very quickly bring things down and like McElroy you know, McElroy didn't perform this week but McElroy is another player who hasn't performed in months like Lee Westwood had a brilliant couple of weeks earlier in the season hasn't performed in months Tyrrell Hatton I saw people questioning Tyrrell Hatton off there was wild card that he'd get picked Tyrrell Hatton's the fourth highest ranked European in the world but again his form over the last two three months has just been disastrous so too many of these players have been in a bad run of form at the wrong time and maybe a different a different manager a different captain obviously does things differently but end result record or not is a USA win it, the, the Rory interviews afterwards are really interesting and I guess there's a lot of sports people who say that the older they get the the more they care the more nervous they get the more emotional they sometimes get and maybe that's what we're seeing now kind of a more emotional older version of Rory McIlroy like I'm, I'm not sure if that's a fair thing to say and, and, and if so at what point does it start to go the other way that there's a, a more mellow version of Rory McIlroy that as you say the nerves don't get to him a little bit more or the emotion maybe doesn't get to him as much as perhaps it has been over the last few years well I think that is the big question about Rory how do you get that spark out of McIlroy like McGinley always talks about him needing the elbows out that that's McIlroy is best when he's in a bit of a scrap when he's trying to prove something when you think back to his major wins with Mickelson and Fowler and he sort of pushes past them on the last hole in the darkness because he wants to get finished and win this and he's so upset that the two of them are sort of talking and laughing on the tee and that that drove him on we don't seem to see that with Rory and this isn't the first time we've seen Rory in tears at the end of a round in the last couple of years remember Port Rush as well and that's what I'm saying about Rory from what he's saying seems to want that pressure seems to want that emotion and seems to want it something something a bit bigger than just the trophy he wants a connection but actually when it's there he doesn't seem to be able to bring the best out of himself so at port rush we all remember what happened to port rush and how disastrous it was now he felt he left everybody down and again the assumption is coming into this Ryder cup he's a natural leader for this team but he, he didn't play well he played as he admitted himself he was played desperately poor over the first two days and that does have a knock-on effect when one of your best players does that so I, I don't think you can criticize McElroy or I don't think anyone is for the tears or any of that but he's in a strange place at the moment there's no question about that I think everyone's struggling to figure out where Rory is it feels like watching him last night that golf is still a massive priority for him and that he desperately wants to go and achieve something but the Ryder Cup's an irrelevance for Rory McIlroy in terms of his legacy. You know, everything is built around majors. It feels he wants everything, though. He doesn't want just to be the major champion, the four-time major champion. He wants to be the Ryder Cup hero as well. We're actually, you know, just go win yeah. seven majors. Uh, Europe's look, greatest ever player. We're out of time. Cup will just, it'll happen. We're out of time, but uh, 30 seconds. Brooks and Bryson buddies again, or no? Nah, nah, nah. Uh, Bryson wants them to be buddies. Bryson wants an end to this. He just wants the respect and the love of Brooks. And the two hugs last night, the first one beside the green, you could tell. Bryson went in for the the proper full-on hug where Brooks just wanted a little shake of the hand. And then I don't know if you saw the American press comments where they're forced together afterwards. Uh, kind of like, you know, two 13-year-olds with all their mates getting around telling them to have a little bit of a kiss. Uh, the two of them are pushed together. They again have an embrace. But it's all Bryson... It's all Bryson doing the hugging right there. Brooks just really, really wants to be anywhere else. So uh, I, maybe it brings an end to some of the nonsense and Brooks realises, maybe some people have had a word with him this week, that he shouldn't be stirring the pot. But Bryson, Bryson had a really good week in terms of his profile because everyone loved what he was doing. Like four balls couldn't suit him better. He could take all the risks in the world. The crowd absolutely embraced that. But I don't think, I, I, I don't think they like each other at all. All right. Nathan, good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers. Cheers, lads. Four minutes past nine this morning here on OTBAM. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. For more goodness from the golf world, uh, catch all the fallout from the Ryder Cup with Golf Weekly. You can sign up to the world's greatest golf podcast on Patreon for three ninety nine a month. Uh, right, we are going to take a quick break. We're back talking rugby with Alan Quillen. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? If not, here's some of what you've missed over the last week. Ronaldo's got that twist now and pivot in the air. Yeah. I look at him doing that and I'm thinking, oh, be careful. Yeah. That's like cruise shit. <laughs> That's potential cruise shit in the making. I think that was a bad move from David Morris. Would you have been comfortable? So we know he can score penalties. 
you haven't had a kick of the ball, but sure, you've done it a million times before. When you go off the bench like that and you haven't had a kick of the ball, mate, you haven't done that a million times before. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Patrick McHugh says Joshua, Ryder Cup, AFL, Grand Final in Perth, Man United losing again, Liverpool 3 all, Formula 1, UFC 266, All Blacks winning another championship. South Africa found out what a glorious weekend of sport. A fellow South Africa hater there, Patrick McHugh. Uh, Fergus Keogh says in the red, US golf fans booing Europe's players on the first tee and the clown yelling freedom after every American <laughs> shot. Individual American golf fans, yes, in the red, sure. But I think putting them all in the red because they're booing, like, that's not what we want. The thing is, if... They're not there to cheer the Europeans. If the American golf fans were doing this ironically, they would be the funniest collection of people on earth. The problem is, it's not ironic whatsoever. So we're, we're like, it, the, the difference is we're laughing at them rather than with them, but we're still laughing. It's still happiness that we're getting from this. It's entertainment and, um, I mean... If it literally doesn't matter. That's the thing. Yeah. That's why like it's funny. That. Well, to, to us it doesn't. I mean, if you're, I mean, imagine you're standing over the first tee and, yeah, and somebody's yelling free. Yeah, come on. This you're, is exactly you're going what over you with your three wood. Um, yeah. And that would be entertainment for us as well. And I would like, I would, I would be all there for seeing Jerry Gilroy get arrested for whacking a man with a, a golf club. <laughs> but, uh, like, that's the point. It's for the golfers, maybe, if, you're in, if, if you want to uh, protect them and all that. And no, uh, but uh, my buddy who was there was saying that the Europeans were feeding off it and getting their eyes out of them and doing it. And, like, it, it, it's in, it's all, we don't see the full story all we hear is oh they're louts they're American louts the worst mm. kind particularly when you're you know writing for the English newspapers well yeah and like the, the people you need to listen to in all this are the European players and there's not a whole pile of them that have been uh, offended by this no it's always been the American players that have offended the Europeans Peter G says the pain from this defeat for the continent is right up there with the Lions defeat the rest of the world team losing in soccer aid and the over 25s not producing a winner in the X Factor <laughs> Peter G, not a golf fan, not a rugby fan either, it turns out, but a um, big fan of uh, the world team in soccer. We need to put our heads together, uh, create a think tank around how the over 25s can finally produce an X Factor winner because it's a, it's a drought at this point. Now that that's your, they're your people. I know that was a significant, like the first, the first step in, in life is realising that you're too old for Hogwarts. The second one is realising that you would be in the older category in X Factor and then the rest of your life is just boring adulthood. <laughs> Yeah, seven minutes past nine this morning. Let's turn to the weekend of rugby. Alan Quinlan is with us. Alan, welcome back. How are you? Morning, lads. Good, thanks, Joe. How was the first weekend of the URC? Uh, it was good, yeah. Um, I think there was a lot of good rugby played. Uh, the intrigue was obviously, well, how would the South Africans get on and what would they bring to the tournament? Um, they're all off the back of curry cups and stuff like that, so they're match fit. So I thought they'd be... Um, I thought obviously they're missing their spring box and stuff like that. So I, I thought that, uh, particularly in the Bulls and the Sharks game, that um, they'd run Munster and Leinster a bit closer. But um, so that was a bit disappointing that there was two big scores there. Um, but it was good to have it back, and you know, hopefully it'll grow and there'll there'll be decent rugby throughout this competition. Okay, a lot of talk in the papers in the immediate aftermath of the Munster game about how Zebo is the X factor that Munster needed. They've also got Snyman coming off the bench, so he's they're slowly working back to a level of fitness. Whatever gaps there were in Munster's squad appear to be disappearing, and there is no longer a, oh, if only they had strength and depth, if only they had a bit of an X factor, if only they had a bit more grunt in the pack. They've got everything now, so it's now that we can finally judge this team and this coaching ticket and this group of players. Well, I wouldn't say they've everything. They've 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 a fair bit of depth. Um, I think uh, there's still a couple of areas of concern. Probably front row um, and centres. When when and maybe out half if if Carberry's injured again. You know, there's there's good players coming through. Ben Healy and Jack Crowley, Jake Flannery. But you know, it's 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 really. It seems to have gone against them in the big knockout games and, and games towards the end of the season when they've had a couple of injuries where those issues have come up. Um, but there's there's a fair bit of depth there throughout the whole squad. And, you know, when Munster get their full team out in the fields for the big European games and the, these big knockout stages, I think um, 
there'll be an expectation that they have to deliver this time and and get their hands on a trophy and look they're working hard to do that and you can't you can't fill every position and have have international depth in every position but there's a fair you know there's a fair bit of talent coming through um and as i said it's still a couple of concerns maybe your own tight head hooker international depth top quality standard there you know if the Linde and farrell don't play um it could be an issue for them particularly in the bigger games but um it's exciting for them but we say that nearly every season and you know i suppose rightly or wrongly they get they get judged pretty harshly and and that expectation is kind of growing again and having Snyman back is wow that's that's incredible for them um if they can get him fit and get him playing being involved he's a game changer i think um Zeba looks fit looks hungry um i'm sure he's he's going to try and make an impression try and get back, back into the irish squad and you know cj sanders gone so jason jenkins came in you know some people were positive and negative about signing another South African, but um, he's, and there's a lot of talent in the back row, you know, Gavin Coombs on Saturday night, I just think um, his ability to score tries and just his overall involvement in the game was was brilliant. Um, physically, he's so powerful, still such a young player, and he makes me excited. Thomas Ahern coming off the bench, I think he's incredible potential as well. So there's a, you know, you there's a couple of really good young players coming through there and um, I'm sure Johan van Graan will try and get the best out of him this year and, and there's pressure on him and his coach and take it for Munster too. <laughs> you know, even if they don't win a trophy, they've got to they've got to have more strings to their bow this year, yeah. particularly in their big knockout games. So there was a lot of talk about in the papers about him getting a new deal. Uh, what's your understanding? What do you think is going to happen there? Is the right thing to do to, to try and have a little bit of longevity and a bit of, uh, you know, not rip everything up again or is it to wait and see what happens this year and if, if things don't progress, well, then maybe the right thing for everybody is a, a, a change. Yeah, look, I think they're, they're, it's kind of a pivotal period of time for Johan and um, Stephen Larkham and, and Graham Rowntree. Um, the excitement around, particularly Larkham and Rowntree, when they came in, um, was was big. Um, I think there's obviously been a bit of frustration. But the big the big talking points um, is maybe the way they've played and and the, the disappointment in some of those knockout games when they've got to them. Um, you know the most recent one obviously is the Pro 14 final last year, and Munster never really fired a shot. By their own admission, they didn't. Um, they still had a lot of positives throughout the season and a lot of really good performances. The Toulouse game against a really strong Toulouse side, you know, they could have won that game, um, played against a brilliant side, no crowd there, probably obviously at Tom Park makes a huge difference. And rightly or wrongly, they're the ones you're going to be judged on because there is pressure to try and be in semi-finals, be in finals and win trophies. So I suspect that, I'm not really sure, and it's only speculation that maybe um between here and Christmas it's kind of similar to to players contracts you know that if Johan van Grand is going to get an extension I suspect in the next kind of two to three months that um that decision will be made obviously for both sides it has to be made you know you can't have a coach going into January February and not knowing if he's staying he's staying on or not or if his contract has been extended so I presume the next little while that those discussions will be going on behind the scenes and um, there'll be decisions made around that. Obviously, you've got a. He's got a. We we're not really sure because, and, and he's right not to go into it too much the other day when he was asked. But what's his desire to go there? What are their options around the table? Um, you know, does he want to stay on? What's his plan for the future? And where's the progression? Like any organisation, there'll be. I'm sure it'll be reviewed and looked at, and um, and that they're the kind of decisions that have to be made for the next while. So um, you're talking about longevity and um, stability. You don't really, yeah. You don't want to, yeah. Look, I think you don't want a situation um, where this is run, running on, and and it's he's been asked this every week, and the players have been asked, and that uncertainty is there. Of course, you want that stability, but I think I suspect it'll be between here and and 
the end of the end of the year when when there'll be a decision made either way. If it was a case that there was a decision that his contract wasn't being renewed, well, that kind of creates lots of cracks and and um, uncertainty in in the group. Um, yeah, and it's risky. You make a decision to that the coaching ticket is staying the same and there's an extension and some of the performances are poor, um, well then the noise outside the group um, starts to increase. So it's it's a tricky one. But look, over the next period of time, I suppose they'll, you know, we'll know more. Look, there's a, there is a very good squad there, Jared, but, you know, it's been a good few years now in, in the same situation come the knockout stage where we've, you know, people have questioned that and be frustrated and disappointed not necessarily and this this sounds like a silly statement not necessarily by being beaten in semi-finals or finals but some of those performances at pivotal in those big games have been really disappointing it feels like this has to be a massive season for joey carberry allen yeah it does i think he's he's um obviously the long layoff and the injury um was very difficult for him <clears throat> He's an incredibly talented player and I think people want him to succeed, um, want him to get back on the Irish squad, uh, want to play well. And, and you know, prior to the World Cup in 19 and, and probably in, respectfully I say this, with, with a, with a lesser, le- lesser, stronger squad, um, when he was starting for Munster and playing for Munster, he was playing very, very well and really important. Um, we haven't seen that kind of spark or excitement from Joey, yes. And I did say this last year, and, and I know when you come back from a long-term injury, it isn't necessarily just about that 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 injured point in your leg or wherever. The rest of the body needs to fire up. You need to get match sharp. You need to get physically ready for it and um, get that bit of zip going. So he played a good few matches last year towards the end of the season, and we saw glimpses, but... Um, we still haven't seen that electric Joey Carby, that exciting, free-flowing. Um, it's not to say these performances are bad, but I think you know when 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 you're an international player and you're of the quality he is, I think um, people want to see that spark back. And he's vital for Munster, absolutely. He's a brilliant player, um, and I just hope that 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 ru- a run of good form comes to him and uh, and he gets a lot of matches and gets physically up to speed. When it comes then, just to finish up on, on Munster, if that contract was to be decided in the morning, do you think that Van Gran has done enough to, to get extended? It's a difficult a difficult question. I think, look, there's been, there's been lots of positives and highs in the last number of years and, and a couple of false dawns. So it's, it's difficult. I think this is, and any sort of assessment of whether a coach stays or not. Um, he's been very unlucky with some of the injuries, notably Carberry and, you know, Snyman coming in. Um, injuries they've had around other players and stuff like that. Um, even though they've signed a lot of outside players and there's been a lot of, there's plenty of overseas guys there, there's still a couple of positions that if I was coach, I'd like to strengthen in those areas that, they just haven't logistically been allowed to do for um, through the RFU. So um, it's been there's been a fair bit of pressure. And like I said, the end of last season probably was the most frustrating um, with the you know that Pro 14 final. And okay, I guess we. So I don't know. I don't know. It's a difficult one. I think he's um, there's a lot of good foundations there, but I, I just feel that they've got to kick on this year for him, for the players themselves. Well, it's a, good, a good start on Friday in terms of the quality of the performance. To to talk yeah, briefly about the the Leinster performance, um, obviously they essentially had their access to most of their full full first team, and it was interesting in that uh, they went for two out halves essentially at ten and twelve with Frawley picked at 12. Maybe this is the future for Irish rugby generally for the, the late stage Johnny Sexton era if he's going to be playing for Ireland which you would expect that we might have a 12 there who was another out half so that when Sexton goes off or if Sexton doesn't start that we have somebody who's getting that level of experience. 
Yeah, and I like Kieran Frawley. I think he's a really good footballer. Um, it's 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 a real option from from many teams now. Um, you know, your traditional kind of twelve who punches up and and. Uh, runs hard off lineouts and scrums um, is still a very very good weapon to have. But to have a footballer there, particularly with you know distribution, trying to get width in the game. Hopefully, this new law, the 50 20, 22 law, that opportunity for players to kick in the backfield and and regain the lineout, um, kick from your own half, and and obviously if it bounces into touch, you get the lineout. That the idea of that is to try and get teams to hold some more players in the backfield and hopefully that we get more expansive rugby because look, particularly after the Lions tour, I think you look at the the level of attack and the amount of kicking that's in the game and, and Leinster kind of, they're a side that do kick a lot as well, but they usually kick a lot when when they're ahead and they squeeze the life out of teams and, and having an option as a 12 for any team who obviously you've got to be have a physical presence as well and be able to match the opposition when they attack you and run at you. Um, but having that sort of dist- distributor is, um, I'd be a fan of it for any team. And, you know, I think Frawley has done really, really well. And it was a good Leinster performance, I think. Um, you know, Munster played well too, and there's a lot of positives, but I just still think some of the distribution in the Munster game was needs to get better. Um, and... I was probably disappointed with the Sharks and the Bulls that, you know, as I said, on the back of Curry Cup performances and match fitness, that we they should have been better. See, yeah, we, yeah, we see two big score lines, sure, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's really not what the competition needs. It needs uh, much closer games. And in fairness, a lot of the other games were um, pretty close. The the Connacht game they, they certainly um, got a bit of a wake up call and uh, I think the Ulster game had plenty of excitement in it as well so look we, we'll get into Connacht and we'll get into Ulster's performance a little bit later on in the week and we get the opportunity to preview next weekend as well we should talk about the biggest story in our rugby over the course of the weekend really and that's the collapse of the women's team who now won't even qualify for the repechage for the World Cup let alone the World Cup this is on the back of um, a disastrous World Cup when the World Cup was staged here and this, it seems like, is a trend in Irish women's rugby as opposed to a shock. Yeah. Um, I think, look, they've, they've, there's, there's been a fair few emotional responses from people online. Um, it was heartbreaking to see them lose on, at, at the weekend, I think. You know, I was talking with Adrian Friday here and... It's always risky when you're talking about bonus point wins. Um, God be good to poor Axel uh, when we played at Munster and we ever went out needing bonus point wins. You know, he continuously was knocking any sort of talk during the week about it. Um, always talking about the performance, getting the fundamentals, the basics right. And unfortunately for this Irish women's team, the same problems arose again. Um, game management, um, the skill set, and the set piece, which has been a problem from the very start, you know, they were favourites to win this tournament and qualify without any problems. But all those issues surfaced against against Spain. Um, things were better against Italy, uh, kind of covered over some of the cracks, though. And unfortunately, you know, if your lineout is not functioning, your scrum is under pressure. It's going to be very, very difficult to to win games. So I think. There's lots of questions to be to be answered here, but ultimately, you know, I, I hear people, a lot of people giving out about the RFU and blaming the RFU. It's obviously the RFU have got to take this in the chin and maybe it'll be reviewed and, and looked at what can be better. And um, But ultimately, these performances weren't good enough and the basics weren't there. And, and that's the most disappointing thing because to see that heartbreak in the women and the emotion they showed and the disappointment um, to be not going to New Zealand next year is, is heartbreaking for them. But um, unfortunately, the performances weren't good enough. So uh, is it your view that this isn't just an IRFU problem that the players need to shoulder more responsibility or is it that actually uh, this needs to be a, a big moment for the women's game where we look back at how we had a team that was capable of beating the All Blacks in a World Cup and reaching the semi-finals essentially in the last decade, and we've gone from there to not being good enough to get into a playoff 
to qualify for the World Cup? Yeah, look, um, of course the RFU have got to take take responsibility here and um, and look at this and review this and see what they can do better. But the reality here, Ger, is this team have got a lot of support. Um, they've got a lot of support from the union in preparation for this this tournament. And I hear a lot of the, the have they though have they though Pardon? like do we not do we not take some of the best players out of the fifteen side and make them play sevens for ages over the last two or three years in the in the well, in the hope of getting to the Olympics and somehow like it seemed like it was not very joined up thinking if we wanted to qualify for the World Cup you get your best players playing fifteens you bed them into a team and the setup becomes good like it, it, do we not handicap I them. Think, I, I think that's worked both ways because the the sevens have a lot a couple of the sevens players have come over and played in the fifteens and that's an issue as well because of you know it's a different game but let's just <coughs> look look at where the team is at one of the big issues here is is how whoever made the decision to allow the women with very 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 little rugby played to go into this tournament in that position when we had inter pros a couple of weeks ago and none of the internationals played. Um, those games are on TV. The game has been showcased here a lot in the last couple of years, and there is a big push to try and um, give the women the exposure they deserve. Those interpros are on the TV. They should have been moved back a couple of weeks. All those internationals should have been playing in this, those interpros, getting battle hardened for this tournament. How, how can you go into a tournament, Chair, with no matches played, really, and expect to get all these issues and problems that are, uh, arose um, and and we're wondering why they arose because you know there's only so much training. There's a lot of camps in the last year with the team. The AL didn't get back up and running after the pandemic. It did in England and France. That's another issue. Um, you can't just expect to turn up to these tournaments. Um, are the the Spain, Italian, Scottish teams funded more and supported more? Probably not. Um, I think a lot of effort and time. So it's easy to throw all the blame in the RFU and say that it's their fault here. It's not. The coaching team, and if this was the men's team, they'd be ripped apart. Um, so I, I, I'm not saying that in any way that the women have to be ripped apart. No, but I think the coaching team here of Adam Griggs and his coaching side have to you know, take responsibility as well with these performances. Um, what, why... Why isn't the lineup working? Why is the catch pass so poor? Um, there's a lot of good players there. You have, you know, Baby Parsons, who's a, a match winner, um, not getting the ball. So there's an inability to get this weight in the game and stuff like that. So a lot of the basics didn't didn't work here and didn't happen here. And absolutely, there's probably more things that the union could have done. But I think this team team has prepared with a lot of camps and the high performance unit. Um, high performance sensor in Aberstown. You know, they've conditioners, they've support staff, they've video analysis. Um, it's not as if they're lacking in in the, the, the recent preparation of this team. What needs to happen and what could be better? The the AIL needs to improve and the the grassroots of rugby to have more options, to have more competitive games, not one sided games, it's probably four really strong teams four or five strong teams in AL that has to increase so there's no quick fix solution here but the easy thing is to blame the RFU for everything here of course they can do better and they can do certain things better but um, what we saw in the last couple of weeks and you know the players have to take responsibility themselves is, is mistakes and poor performances against teams that they should have beaten and it's heartbreaking for them and it's really disappointing, and you know my heart went out to them. There's, um, it's 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 a it's a really tough situation for them. But um, ultimately, you can't make that many mistakes and expect to win matches. Okay, we're going to hear more from Fiona Cochran about this in a couple of minutes' time as well. So, just wanted to get your perspective on it too. Alan, good stuff. Thanks, a million. Cheers. Thanks, that's Alan Quillen giving us his thoughts there on the weekends URC and of course on the women's uh, collapse as well. Uh, it's uh, 9.29 this morning here on OTBAM. If you want to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. 0879-180-180. Or, of course, you can always get us on uh, the WhatsApp, sorry, on the YouTube stream as well. Uh, so that's youtube.com forward slash off the ball for the live subscription there. Um, yeah, so that's us up to date on those comments. Yeah, absolutely. There's... Um 
uh, obviously a big reaction to that and the, the rest of the weekend as well just people running through what they want to see or what they wanted to see in the performance rankings I'm not sure if everybody got their wish necessarily uh, the AFL Grand Final in Perth didn't uh, didn't get mentioned we didn't I really mentioned Joshua we gave all the credit to, to Usyk this morning as well and of course we stuck the boot into South Africa were you were like I mean does your South Africa rugby beef extend into the uh, this new competition that we've got the Bulls and the Sharks getting uh, destroyed. Are you like, yeah, hook that to my veins? Uh, it'd be nice. It'll be nice to see what happens when they get their Springboks through, because obviously they don't all have a, a slew of Springboks playing for the team at the moment. A lot of the best players from South Africa are actually playing, of course, in, in different leagues around the world. So, um, I look, the jury's out on the URC. We'll see if it works. Um, it's obviously a, a concocted tournament that. Uh, if it captures the imagination of the rugby public, then has the potential to go big. But equally, it has the potential to be one of those kind of rugby tournaments that doesn't really make any sense. We'll see. Uh, now, let's move on, because if you haven't heard already, OTB are taking on another duathlon. It's all brought to you by Whoop, the digital fitness and health coach that provides personalised sleep, recovery and training insights. Check out whoop.com for more details. And to chat how training's been going... Uh, and to tell us a bit about what we're actually going to be doing. I'm delighted to say Maxine Strain, the race director of Nace Triathlon Club, is with us to talk to us about the duathlon which starts in Punchestown. Maxine, good morning to you. How are you? Hi, good morning. Um, so the, the destination for the Galco Nace duathlon on October the 10th, we start at Punchestown, but we don't just stay in Punchestown, do we? What's the course? That's correct. So uh, we start off in front of the main grandstand in the Punchestown race course, and we do one full loop of the perimeter of the race course itself. So that's about a three, just over three kilometer run. Then you go back into transition in front of the main grandstand, out the gate and off to Blessington. So it's 10 Ks there, 10 Ks back on the cycle, back to transition again, jump off the bike and you do another loop of the race course itself. There's two kind of peaks on the cycle that uh, we've just shown on the graph there, Maxine. How high are those peaks? Uh, they're not too bad. I don't know the exact height of them, but the overall elevation is just over 200 meters for the 20 kilometers. So it's, it's not too difficult. Uh, depends what training you've done and, and what you're used to. That's the uh, $64 million question, isn't it, Maxine? <laughs> yeah. Tommy, Tommy Rooney is here with us as well. Tommy, how's your training getting on? Morning, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm still taking it easy. I'm, uh, I'm trying to build myself up to it quietly without uh, pulling my hamstring again. So I'm, uh, I'm a little bit worried that uh, I'm not going to be ready to go on the tenth spot. I've got twelve days to go, Chair. So uh, a little bit worried. But the whoop uh, is helping with the recovery and in between sessions. So um, the cycle, I've, I kind of left the bike for a while, Maxine. So I'm a little bit worried about those, uh, those hills on the way to Blessington. I think key here is you're gearing on your bike. You're not going to kill yourself going up the hills otherwise you're just going to have to be recovering as soon as you get to the top. So just pacing yourself and enjoy the day. So you're a triathlete yourself, is that right? I beg your pardon? You're a triathlete yourself. You've, have you done this course? I, absolutely. Um, I have done the course myself probably as very much a novice uh, only just a few years ago. So um, like yourself, I was concerned about those two little uh, hills on the bike course. So um, it's it's very enjoyable day. There's a there's a wide range of abilities on the race day itself, from complete novices and and anyone who can jog or or owns a bike is welcome to take part, right up to those athletes who are you know trying to get a personal best on the course. Maxine, would you have any advice for the the final leg of the race? Because that's definitely something we did at duathlon last year, and that's definitely something I find difficult. When you get back off the bike, your legs are just jelly. Absolutely. Uh, we have a, um, a specific training session called a brick session. So you actually train yourself to run off the bike. So if you go too hard on the bike, your legs are going to be absolutely wrecked and you won't be able for that second run at all. So pacing yourself is very important. If you do one of the disciplines in isolation, for example, a, a long cycle or a hard cycle, that's fine. You don't have to do anything but lie on the couch afterwards but a three kilometer run can be very challenging. So training that, doing a very small brick run straight after your cycle in training helps to just get your legs used to that feeling. As you say, jelly legs is exactly uh, what it feels like. You feel out of control, you might just collapse, but that's certainly trainable and uh, pacing, of course, is, is important. We don't want anybody collapsing. That's... <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm laughing because it's very possible. <laughs> that's it's my, it's my scared laugh there, just in case anybody was, uh, you know, uh, not not fully aware. Um, how many people are taking part, Maxine? Uh, we have up to 200 on the day. We still have entries available. Um, I think the season normally starts off with triathlon in January, February, March, traditionally. But with COVID, things are a little bit back to front. We're just taking the opportunity to run our race because it's a very popular event. Uh, a lot of people would, would participate year on year. So, um, yeah, there's still space available. And uh, as a matter of interest, how big is the sport at the moment in NACE? I know as uh, somebody from a tie myself, the, the importance that tri has had in just kind of injecting the whole area, really, with an interest and an enthusiasm. And then it's this mad, brilliant occasion in the town as well. So I, I guess it's something similar for NACE, is it? Absolutely. We normally run three duathlons um, in the beginning of the season, as I said, January to March. And then usually in September, we would have a novice full triathlon, which is pool-based in the Killashi pool. So it's a great beginner uh, type of event for someone who might be a bit nervous in the open water. So with the restrictions and the way things have been, we haven't been able to run that this year. But um, it's a great opportunity, you know, to put NACE on the map and for us to get uh, an influx of people into the area. Well, listen, we wish you the very best of luck with it, Maxine. We'll obviously see you on the day. Tell me, if I, before we let you go, how is your training actually going? It's going right, Ger. I'm not too worried about times this year. I don't know if Maxine has gone now, but I'd like to have asked what a good time would be this year. She's still there. If you, uh, yeah, so go on. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that uh, that's up to your, your own, you know, objectives for the race itself. If you are looking to just get through it, um, the transition is something that you'd have to get your head around and be proficient at that. It's, it's free time. It's part of the race. They often refer to it as the fourth discipline. So if you can put your runners on and get on and off your bike fairly quickly, you can make a good time. Um, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to put you on the spot for the time. <laughs> it's, it's up to your your own PBs, really. Um, I think uh, everyone everyone is. It's you against you at the end of the day. Okay, thanks. That's that's good to know. Okay. Um, Jerry, how's the training going? The training's going all right. Actually, interestingly, off what Maxine is saying there, I tried to uh, tried to do that last week when I was out running. I I did a run and then got on the bike for uh, ten kilometers and went for a run again. And it, like it's it's hard to explain how difficult it is until you do it. Like I hadn't realized it last year. I think I just did it for the first time last year, uh, hopping on and doing that run. And you, you can you can barely move after it. It's unbelievable the difference it makes. Yeah. I went for my first run yesterday and uh, was supposed to cycle in today and was unable to. So we'll see how the rest of the week uh, goes. What, just out of interest, what did your whoop say this morning? Like, was your recovery poor? Or uh, my, I haven't actually checked it yet this morning, Tommy. But okay. uh, I, I think my recovery was okay because I, I went to bed, essentially, to recover. So uh, I'm still getting my head around the whoop recovery aspect as well. Um, I went for, I trained hard on Friday, went for a bit of a run on Saturday. I thought I got a good night's sleep and my recovery was only 35% in my whoop, but... I had two points of stout on Saturday night, so maybe that was the problem. Uh, my recovery was 84%, but it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't feel that way with my muscles, I've got to say. All right, good stuff. Uh, Tommy, thank you for joining us, and we'll, we'll check in again with you again. And Maxine, thanks a million for all your help. We're going to be... Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me on. ...bright-eyed and bushy-tailed on the uh, 10th of October uh, around Punchestown and then out to Blessington and then back to Punchestown for our lap of honour or dishonour as it may well be and that's um, because we're all taking part in another duathlon brought to you by Whoop the digital fitness and health coach that provides personalised sleep recovery and training insights check out whoop.com for more details and we'll keep you up to date with how that is going there so uh, that is the crack you're, you you somehow managed to avoid anything any of this now you're, you're yeah. back now still plenty of time tickets still available two weeks to go you'd be doing the same amount of training as us yeah, yeah, no, um, I, I won't uh, be doing that, but uh, I uh, will be supporting you from the sideline. Uh, I, I have legitimate excuses this time as well, but had I not had them, I probably would have invented them. Right. Uh, what are your legitimate excuses? I, I almost destroyed my bike, and I need to get that fixed, actually. Oh, okay, of course, yeah. It's just, uh, it's just a scrap heap in my house, just uh, the handlebars at the back. And all that, it's just, uh, it's just somebody needs to untangle the whole thing and, and fix it. Um, but good luck. And are you, is your wrist okay and all? My wrist is back. My wrist is good. All right. Yeah. Join us tomorrow morning from half past seven. We'll be back looking at the Champions League. More on rugby this weekend and uh, plenty more besides. Right now, we're bringing you more reaction to the weekend sport. Here's Fiona Hayes talking about the fallout in Irish rugby. Maxwell looks up. She sees it's on from Law. Spread along. Hands into the corner. Chloe Rowley is going to get there. 
needs to get close to the posts. Scotland have given themselves a kick for a chance at the World Cup. Scotland have wow. to get this kick, Phil. Wow. Given the points difference between the two, if it is a draw, it will come down to points difference, and Ireland have that already wrapped up before kickoff. This for another chance to go to the Rugby World Cup next year. Scotland have done it. <laughs> they have downed Ireland. Yeah, that was the moment that Ireland missed out on a place at next year's Women's Rugby World Cup in New Zealand. It was all going OK until 50 seconds to go when Ireland found themselves in the defensive position inside their own 22. It was worked out wide. Scotland were able to get around to the post to make the uh, kick a little bit more attainable. Went between the posts. Scotland winning by 20 points to 18. A draw or a win would have sent Ireland to the Repugé where they would have played against uh, some of the Asian teams who have not already qualified for the World Cup in New Zealand. If they got a bonus point victory, they would have went directly to next year's World Cup. That place going to Italy and Scotland will go to the next qualifier tournament where they are expected to book their place at the World Cup. It's a huge disappointment for Ireland, who you will remember back in 2014 beat New Zealand at the World Cup and qualified for the semi-finals of the tournament. A member of that team was Fiona Hayes, who I'm delighted is with me now uh, to break down what went wrong at this European qualifying tournament. Uh, Fiona, how are you getting on this afternoon? I'm good, Will. Thanks for having me on. I think my heart broke a little bit there again listening to that over. It's been a, it's been a tough uh, few hours. It's almost like a dream for me. I, I really, really thought we were going to qualify for this World Cup. It's a horrible way to lose a game, but in many ways, the first game against Spain probably came back to haunt because the second round results played everyone back in and everyone was level going into the final day. Italy got their bonus point win against Spain, so it meant even a kickoff time at five o'clock in Parma Adam Grigside knew exactly what they had to do to qualify or to go on to the next stage of qualifying. And like realistically, with the way that they were managing the game, you didn't really see Scotland coming back and getting a late score to take it away at the end. No, and 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 that's the thing. I mean, I thought Ireland's performance at times was was quite good. Obviously, game management came into place in the last maybe 15, 20 minutes where where that just didn't happen for the girls. And and I thought like they came out with great intent. You know, I, I, I actually I, I actually felt like it was going to be a good performance. I was looking at the start, the 15 minutes, thinking we could actually get the bonus point win here. But it just seemed to die down. And I suppose Scotland had those two moments right before half time and right after half time. And that's where you get killed if if a team can get you in those two kind of parts of the game, I think you're you're in big trouble then. We can talk about some of the wider issues around women's rugby and why things have not kicked on, particularly since the World Cup in 2017 and the slash in funding. But on a very basic fundamental level, going right back to the Spain game, I remember watching the first half and there were so many dropped passes and dropped opportunities and good scoring areas which weren't converted that came back to haunt when they were beaten 8-7 improved a bit in the performance last week against Italy and then as you say it was a mixed bag against Scotland but realistically after a long training camp after a period in Italy to accum to acclimatise before playing this tournament Ireland should have been able to sweep out Spain, Italy and Scotland to go to the finals realistically. Absolutely Will and you know what um, I've said and I've talked with this with ex-players and, and we're in WhatsApp groups and we're obviously all constantly discussing each game and discussing issues around the game but for me I suppose when we look at that Spain game drop passes you're 100% right the girls weren't match ready They're, they haven't been playing games they've had numerous camps and when you play at an international level it's it's very very different to the intensity that you would play even the first 10 minutes can be quite hectic until you get your second wind so for me I don't they were taken away from their clubs you know there was an interprose here in Ireland and uh, players didn't play in that interprose it wasn't like it was just leading up I suppose into the qualifiers but they could have maybe looked at maybe having that a little bit earlier and gotten those girls that game time I think was what they, which is what they would have needed and we saw that in the first game against Spain the errors were absolutely crazy from a team that I know have absolute skill and would have worked very very hard in their skills throughout the year. Because I know some players who were very frustrated who were on the fringes of the team who were in camp but hadn't played competitively for quite some time maybe were substitutes or were injured during the Six Nations not getting a look in but yet they've been at two lengthy camps before going to Italy. Realistically when there was a small core group of players that were used throughout this tournament they feel that if they'd been released back out to their provinces to play in the Interpros at least they could have been a bit match sharper coming around to this tournament. 
yeah, th- that's it. Like, I mean, they like to be fair, they I think they released some of the girls from the wider section of squad to Munster and Leinster. I know they and maybe kind of got a couple of players, but but it's it's looking at that. I mean, how there there was no AL. Obviously, the Premiership went on in England, and some of the girls had played matches over there. But but there there was no AIL, you know, because of COVID. But even before that. Like I've coached an AIL team and the girls weren't released a lot of the time to play in those games. So you're talking maybe some girls that might have been 18 months with them out without them actually playing a game of 15s rugby, which is absolutely crazy to think. And I know Spain and Italy would have, would have had the same kind of issues as well, maybe around their, their club and looking at that. But for some reason, it didn't work for us because we went in there and as much as they talked about how great they trained, and I'm sure the camps were intense, and I'm sure they trained at a very high level, it just matched awareness game awareness was absolutely lacking I thought yeah I was trying to Stacey Flood last week and I asked was there a bit of ring rustiness in the first two games and maybe that led to some of the mistakes she put a brave face on it and understandably that's what a player is going to say back out is look our camps have been so intense some of the best Mm. games we've had are A against B and because of the good training that we're doing but then I'd have to look at it Fiona and think look at the line out which is misfired throughout these three games I Mm. can't understand why the line out was so poor and also a decision being made along the way to jettison McDermott and to put Sam Monaghan into the team mid-tournament when McDermott was previously the line-out caller. Like, when your set-piece is such a key part of the game, I can't understand how that would misfire after so much time in camp. Yeah, now, as far as I'm aware, I think, um, like, maybe a couple of months back, they did change the caller and Nicola Friday became the, the main caller. So you're taking out Aoife's height 100%. I mean, that's who their go-to person a lot of the time was. And you could see, like, you can't blame the hooker a lot of the time. There was just, there was missed jumps, there was missed lifts, and it was... It was unusual because I have talked to girls up at camp and that line seemed to be really, really firing and everything was going well. But it's it's that same thing that we talked about earlier. When you don't have opposition, I mean, you're probably throwing up a pod in, in an Ireland team because they know your calls. So they're, you're obviously not going to, you know, go off the calls they're calling. But the Spanish, Italian, Scottish, they were able to get up in front of a lot of times and really, especially the Scottish, really, really disrupt our lineup. And it absolutely... Um, was our downfall at times in that Scottish game. Would the solution have been to try and look for fixtures? Because, look, I accept that there's maybe not the depth of teams that you could play against, and it was particularly awkward because these are European qualifiers, so the teams you would have probably looked to try and get games against are the ones who were actually playing in it. And then England and France are a step above because they're now professional rugby teams. There's probably a shortage of teams you could have played against, but should Ireland have actually sought out some opposition to at least get some games into legs during the summer and heading into this? Yeah, and I think so. And I mean, and like they've like there's seven girls that were that were put in there, and they geez, they performed really well at times. But there's a lot of seven girls that were in there that wouldn't have played 15 rugby maybe in years and years since they were younger. So like if you're doing that and you make that decision, I think it's very very important to get that cohesion in the team. So you need to get these girls fixtures. They need to be playing 15s rugby. It's a completely different game, and no matter how skillful they are in the tackle area with their hands, whatever. When it comes to 15s rugby, it's absolutely 100% a different game. And I think, as I said earlier, I think a solution to that would be maybe bringing the Interpros a little bit earlier, firing them all out to the provinces and, and letting them get that three games under their belt. And if injuries happen, they happen. But you have a backup system and you have players there ready to go waiting in the wings, and well, which they do. Well, I was reading Philip Doyle's tweets earlier and he was uh, pointing fingers at Anthony Eddy around all this and where the balance has been over the last five or six years between resources and time being pumped into the sevens program versus the 15s and some of those sevens players have found themselves into the 15 system and look in some cases it's worked out really well but yeah. i worry when i hear things like you know stacy floods talking about how she's uh, learning the position at out half on the fly through matches that they're playing during the six nations uh, amy lee murphy crow who's never played in defensive systems in the 15s outside of a few club games coming in from sevens you know lucy Mulhall being straight in to play at outside center in a qualifier game it's very difficult to change your instincts from sevens to play in a 15 system when you're having to do so in matches that matter 
Absolutely. And and like I've had this discussion with Alison Miller in the past about Amy Lee Murphy, because to me, she is absolute speed merchant. She's unbelievable. So like I'm not a winger. I was an old slow prop. So I, I wouldn't know what they, they'd be doing out there with their and the wing, you know, when they eventually get the ball. But Ali said like it takes it's actually it's not just a quick shift. So it's not just her speed. It's her footwork, her positioning and everything. And it is going to take her a couple of games to settle. And she did settle, but she got those games on. Under her belt before she went into this qualifier so I think it was very very unfair to throw a couple of girls in there that maybe haven't been involved in these systems and especially at centre as well I mean it's such a pivotal part of of the game plan and you know like obviously Sene really experienced was there with her but but you know it didn't work and I suppose Lucy then was taken out and that that hits the players confidence as well you need to be able to build up and and when I played you know under Goose as you talked earlier under Philip Doyle you had to be out playing your club rugby you had to be there if you weren't he didn't want to know he wanted to see the physicality he wanted to see you playing every single weekend and he'd make his decision sometimes off that and obviously what you bring to camp but some Sometimes I'm feeling at, the, at this moment in time, players are going straight into camp. I know we're trying to get to a more professional setup, but that to me shouldn't mean less games. You know, you've got to, you still got to do the, the groundwork in the AIL, in the interprovincial system and break your way into an international team. And surely it has to be a frustration. If you're a player who's played well for your club and in the Interpros over the last three or four years, you've been in on the Ireland camp, and next thing a sevens player gets jettisoned in and they're straight into the starting 15. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, like, and I've I've talked to some of the girls about it, and obviously, like, you can't say anything publicly. You're mm. you're on a squad, and and those girls are probably the nicest people. You know, it's not their fault either. They're they're asked, they're delighted to represent your country at, at 15s rugby. Absolutely delighted. Why not go in there and take the chance? But it can be frustrating for players that are are playing week in week out as a set of club. They're 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 building their name. Like you look at Chloe Pierce, she had an absolutely amazing interpros. You know, and she's worked. I, I've worked with her in Bowes. She's worked her way up the whole time at club level. And, you know, she's just outside the system. Or she didn't make it into that squad, but she's put in the time and she'll hopefully get there in the future. And she, even though maybe wasn't in the proposition, she'd look on and she'd see some players come in out of nowhere. And I suppose that's as a, as a player and other players, you're, you're just questioning in the back of your mind, what do you need to do to to get in there like is this like you know and, and that's what niggles away at players and I think that can that can stay in your head when you're playing games if I'm honest look I'm not a training so I can't see how Claire Malloy is training along the way but how is Claire Malloy not starting like I couldn't understand that after the Italy game she comes in and puts in a Trojan performance particularly on the defensive side of the game I thought she was nailed on to start I couldn't believe on Friday when the team was announced and it was an unchanged starting 15 and that Claire Malloy wouldn't be in to start Absolutely. I, I'm not up at camp either, so I can't comment on that. But what I can comment on is what Claire Malloy has brought to every single camp I've ever been at in my life. And that is absolute professionalism, aggression. She's like a terrier. She brings the game up. She brings everyone around them up. And what she has now is because she's played a very long time. Is she's a great knowledge of the game. And she knows to be in the right places at the right time. And what, what um, breakdowns to hit, what steals are on. You know, she fans out, all that all that business so I 100% couldn't understand that but that's that's a coaching that's obviously a coaching decision there could be other stuff going on in the background I, I don't know that but for me even when she came on the impact you know she could come on with a chip in her shoulder and be kind of annoyed because she has she's a lot of caps under her belt but she came on in both games and absolutely trained or sorry worked her butt off, as they say on the pitch. And she too amazing. She did a steal in the last 15 minutes. And what would have been probably the turnover of the game, bar what, you know, the yellow card incident, like she just literally got in there and got an absolute steal right when Ireland needed it. Like the back row is the engine room of a team. And I would Absolutely. have thought if you've got Claire Malloy there alongside Kira Griffin, loads of experience of both players, Dorothy yeah. Wall, who's been a bit of a revelation too. That's a well-balanced back row. And that would have been well set up to dominate the game. Yeah, and you know, like and like uh, Adele McMahon is 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 a is a great player as well, and she can play six, and you can vary that up. You can, but for me, having Kira and Claire Malloy there, they would be my two back row definite starters and I'd look outside of that see who's performing even people people make a different impact from the bench you know like you, you might say look this person's going to come on someone like Doherty imagine someone like Doherty coming on for the last 20 minutes it would absolutely boost everything around you so I, I, I don't 
going to understand it personally, but as I said, and you said we're not up at camp, but I would be a, a massive Claire Malloy fan, and I'm 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 very sad today to think that maybe she's probably going to retire on this, which I, I, I think she will. I'm not too sure, but I'd imagine this is probably the end of the line for her with Ireland. Yeah, because like for such a warrior, I know she took her time out when she was in Wales to uh, take a bit of a break when she was working, but for the best part, she's been an ever-present of the transition from your team to this team, and she said that she wanted the players around her to be able to experience the joy of going to a World Cup and competing in a way differently to 2017 when everyone was so disappointed and I just kind of saw her at the end of the game last night and you're thinking this is probably the end of the road for her and for Lindsay Pete and some of the other players who've been uh, campaigning away for a while another player was left out that was an eyebrow up for me and Adam Griggs said to us when the squad was announced that he had spoken to her and she knew why she was being left out was Anna Capeless who seemed to play quite a bit during the last couple of Six Nations and then she doesn't get in, ends up playing for Munster and Interpros. I think she's signed for an English club now at this stage for next season. Were you surprised that Anna Capelis wasn't brought along? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm good pals with Anna as well, so I, I, I know Anna was surprised as well herself. Um, look, she in talking to her, she felt like she was performing really well at camp. She felt she was doing everything she needed to do. She moved home from England to to focus on her game and 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 try and get that cohesion with the girls that were in Ireland. And look, it, it surprised me, but but that's not taken away from anyone that was picked on a squad back row. We 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 all know how competitive it is. It's it's a extremely competitive um uh sorry position. So for for Anna, like I suppose she was a bit kind of upset, but you know you have to you have to look at performance and we're not up at camp, whereas in general we could look at games. You could say, Oh, Anna's played here or this person's done that this week week in, week out. So we can't even comment on that because obviously the camps are closed, but but I do from what I do believe Anna had had been performing well in camp. So it's obviously just um, you know, the coach's decision, which is fair enough. That's his job. Yeah. Still a surprise to me she's on the top 40 players in the country if you're picking a squad uh, to get ready for this. We can hear now from the Ireland head coach Adam Griggs who you know, kind of fell into this position a little bit where it was a part-time contract first but this is what he had to say after Ireland's two-point defeat against Scotland in Parma. Hugely disappointed. Um, you know, we, we thought we had a bit of momentum in that second half um, and then just couldn't see it out I suppose and uh, yeah, I mean it's heartbreaking to watch a final conversion with time up uh, go through the post. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that in the second half, obviously, you, were, you got that momentum and were obviously looking for the, the two other tries. How did things sort of turn around in the last 10 minutes? Yeah, um, I mean, you've got to give credit to Scotland. Um, they, they got the ball back in their hands and they came direct at us. And what we've, you know, based our defence on with line speed and making sure we take the gain line away, we, we were able to do that and part of that was some very good Scotland attack and we just couldn't get our connections right and I mean just soak tackles and um, put them in the right areas of the field and by that try you know we just caught short numbers, we just couldn't make up the numbers to, to cut it off so. Hi Adam, commiserations, um, what do you feel you could have done better to achieve your goals tonight? Uh, I mean We've struggled with our set piece um, this whole tournament. Um, you know, if you don't have a set piece, you, you can't give the, the backs as, as lethal as they are that platform. Um, again, similar to the other games, we, we created opportunities and, and chances and then we just couldn't finish them. And, you know, again, we were probably too slow into our attacking breakdowns and we, we were getting in wrestles there and coming out second best. and that would turn the ball over again. And I think it was just, yeah, look, t too many turnovers um, in vital positions where we know we'd need to, to put scores on and come away with points, and we weren't able to do that. Got 28 women there who had a, a huge goal and, and support staff who have, have worked tirelessly over through a, a COVID pandemic, through Six Nations, through dates being changed, and all with a, a goal that, you know, essentially was, was really close and a, and a last conversion um, takes that away and it's hugely heartbreaking and I just, I feel for all the players and, and the support staff that have put all this work into it and ultimately, you know, we, we thought we were um, on the right track and we thought we had done the preparation and to be successful and sometimes you, you don't always get what you deserve in life and 
it's one of those those things that we just have to take on the chin at the moment and just speaking to the group you know there's a there's a huge core of, of young players there who have done the jersey proud um and this won't be the last time they're in that jersey and i, I guess it was just a matter of once they can take time to reflect on this experience i hope it makes them better rugby players, but also better people um, going through adversity like this. It, it's really tough and I think they need to hold their heads up high and while it's just so upsetting right now, I hope they will uh, bounce back from this. Could more be done for them so that this doesn't happen again in three years' time or whenever the next World Cup is, is on? Uh, look, I, I won't comment on that at the moment. I think we're just trying to focus, we we're trying to focus on this tournament and, and we've fallen short and and the bigger picture stuff is, is for other people to answer uh, in time. And just finally for me, what about yourself? I mean, it's obviously very soon afterwards, but this was the journey and, and you spoke about it throughout. Do you say, see yourself continuing for the Six Nations and everything, considering that's now come to, to an end, or is it too soon to say? I think it's too soon to say. As I say, I'm really... I'm just really proud of the group that are there and some of the young players that are coming through in this on this pathway. And... Um, you know, I've worked as hard as I can to, to get them right and, um, yeah, we'll see what the future holds. Adam Griggs understandably not making a decision on his future in the immediate aftermath after that game in Parma. But Fiona, the winds of change are there with the RFU. You know, Philip Brown is going to step away in the new year. David Nusifor's contract is up for negotiation currently and the current, it's set to run out in the summer of next year. What needs to actually change about the women's system if they're going to qualify for a World Cup in three years' time? I think they, they need to maybe start pumping a bit more money in at grassroots level because um, that's where that's where the players are born and bred and that's where they're, they're playing the rugby. And, and you know, they, they have, like, they've done little changes over the last couple of years. The AIL has a new structure in that. And, you know, maybe maybe even they, they might look at the, the Interpro game and making those longer, game, maybe longer competitions or having something with an, an English team or something coming over Scotland, Wales. But there needs to be something done with the competitiveness level. And that obviously involves investing in these clubs and investing in the women's game. So when you talk money, I think things uh, things certainly change a bit, but it, it has to be done. If we want to progress as, as the nation of rugby, which we should be, there has to be an investment, I think. Yeah, funding has already been slashed over the last couple of years and the RFU don't have a huge amount of uh, spare cash with the pandemic, but we'll see what happens. Fiona, thanks a million for joining us on Off The Ball. OTB AM With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved